Fred covered all the questions that you had yesterday, but I'm happy to answer any that you still have. I need this, I need you guys to smile. The mosquitoes must surrender. We are live on YouTube. Hey Sheha, I think you can you can bring in guests now, all of them. I think. A very, very good morning to everybody. Thank you so much for joining the 37th edition of the Itatara Masterclasses. We are super happy to be joined today by our colleagues from the Innovative Vector Control Consortium. And uh, this is uh, a masterclass that we had earlier scheduled for April the 21st. And uh, because of a COVID infection in my household, it was rescheduled. Uh, and we are lucky that we have found a date for it for today. So thank you so, so much for joining with us consistently for all the days and for supporting the masterclass. Uh, my co-host, uh, Sheila Ogoma and myself will drive uh, uh, this show today. Uh, we send our um, apologies from, or um, a note of absence from our other co-host, Nana Abba Williams, who is unable to join today, but will join us for the next masterclass. 
just so you know, this class is being live streamed on YouTube and my colleagues from Ifakara will share the link to the YouTube channel uh, online with you right away. We are beginning in approximately 30 seconds. And uh, um, among the experts from IVCC, we have Dr. Matthias Mondi, uh, uh, Christian Fornandel. Uh, I hope, Christian, that I'm pronouncing the name correctly. You're muted. Christian Fornadel, you got it. Yes, and we will have Andrew as well. I'm just trying to figure out whether Andrew is on the line. Andrew, if you can turn on your video. Well, Excellent. Andrew um, Saibu. That's fine. Andrew Saibu is with us. And then we have... Uh, I'm on the line, Fedus. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, we have also Eric Ochomo, who works as a partner of IVCC and is based in Kenya. Uh, Eric will join us for a uh, discussion of certain sections of this work. And we are very hopeful also that we will have uh, Professor Charles Wonji uh, join the discussion, especially with regards to management of insecticide resistance. So uh, uh, Charles, if you are available already online, you can turn on your video and Eric as well. Fantastic, it's nice to see you. And Mike McDonald uh, was gonna join us as well, but unfortunately Mike is on the road. And we appreciate that, uh, uh, his contributions already. So as always, our guests do not need any introductions. They are very well-known experts in this field. And so we usually skip the, uh, the introduction section. My colleague Sheha Salum, uh, administrative support from Ifakara. Uh, Sheha is uh, managing the, uh, the event together with Hal Hal Go, uh, who is a co-host here, and they are going to provide uh, any administrative questions that you guys might ask. And if someone leaves the microphone off, we may mute you once, twice, or we will remove you from the, from the event. But hopefully, you're able to rejoin. Good to go. Hey, Christian, how are you? Good morning. You guys ready to go? All set. Got my coffee. The, mos the mosquitoes must surrender. Isn't that so? Definitely. What are you guys going doing to make this happen? So, uh, from IVCC's perspective, we're working on the new tools that we're going to need to continue our progress um, that we all know has um, stalled a bit in the last few years. We want to make sure that progress continues and that we um, advance it and really um, get those malaria cases down as close to zero as we can, as fast as we can. So, we're working on bringing new innovative tools um, to, to market, both uh, in terms of our core products, our um, IRS products and bed nets, as well as um, new products that help will help fill gaps potentially in the outdoor biting area like ATSBs. Thank you so much. We're going to talk a lot about this uh, this work today. This masterclass is going to um, do a, some kind of a deep dive into the work that IVCC is doing. And I hand over now to my colleague Shayla Goma to start us off. Shayla, please. Uh, thank you very much, Fredros. Um, and I think it, it's it's um, fitting for us to first of all understand what IVCC is all about. Perhaps just a brief um, introduction, Matthias, on 
what IVCC does and what it's all about, please. Thank you very much, Sheila. Thank you very much, Fred Rose. I hope yeah, that you can hear me okay. So IVCC, for those of you on the line who, who do not know the organization, is a product development partnership. That means that we are a charity organization. And we have a very specific mandate, which is to help and support the development of new vector control solution. We have been, uh, we have, we are in existence since uh, 2005, and we are hosted by the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in Liverpool. For, for those who do not know what, uh, what a PDP is and what is important to, to realize is that we are there, we are here, we are in existence because um, we are operating in, in a field that is, uh, that is uh, um, having huge market challenge. That means that uh, people, organization, um, industry would not develop a vector control product and just for the type of public health market that we are dealing with. So we are here to help de-risk innovation and provide funding for the development of product. We are here not only to, to provide the funding, but also to help the way those products are being developed. We are offering a technical platform and a scientific platform. Technical platform because we are having a number of lab and collaboration with a field trial site in order to evaluate the different product. But we have also a scientific platform through an expert scientific advisory committee who are helping and guiding uh, the partners we are working with on the development of those products to make sure that, uh, that they are going to be very effective public health products. We are driven by impact, meaning that we are essentially focusing on development activity. We are doing a little bit of research, but we are only supporting research when this is truly informing the way we are developing our products. Right. And if we have uh, chances to optimize the, the, the way those products are being done. And finally, in our mission, we are also doing education, advocacy and engagement, just because uh, we need to make sure that uh, topics such as malaria eradication is staying very high on the political agenda for, I mean, globally, in order to get uh, the level of attention it deserves in order to, to reach elimination and eradication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, that's excellent. So just a brief overview of what we will be discussing today. So we'll have a pleasure of uh, discussing with our, um, our speakers today. Uh, we will look at the different vector control priorities for the different regions, Africa, Asia, and the Americas. And then we'll have a chance to go through a roadmap right from discovery and development of vector control interventions all the way to access and the different aspects for each, um, for each, um, for each period. And then after that, we will look at uh, the different formulations, insecticide formulations, as well as the new bed nets. And then we will look at the cost effectiveness of the vector control interventions, as well as the impact. And then perhaps just a deep dive of the uh, project on the next generation nets, the different types of nets, as well as the IRS formulations and how this impact is being measured, how the impact is being measured. And then after that, we will um, look at the other interventions other than the classical I IRS and ITMs, which other um, vector control interventions is IVCC working on. And then after that, we will look at the management of insecticide resistance. Since all these vector control interventions are based on insecticides, what is IVCC doing in terms of managing insecticide resistance? Um, Fred, please take it away. Thank you, Sheila. Um, Thank you, Sheila. Thanks, thanks a lot. And uh, to our colleagues from IVCC, uh, there's already 100 people on the line. We expect there will be more. And I think it's the right time now to start dealing, uh, 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 digging in. I just want to say, again, from the Fakara Health Institute side, uh, from, uh, uh, from our side, my, my colleague Sheila and I, this is a service that we provide voluntarily to this uh, 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 community. And uh, we ask that one way that you can support this is to uh, inform many other people to participate and, and share the links. 
uh, with your with your other colleagues uh, whom I want to want to benefit. To proceed, uh, Matthias, uh, Kristen, uh, um, Andrew, um, uh, Charles, and Eric. The malaria control uh, uh, programs around the world at the moment are in a situation where we're relying a lot on what I would call commodities, insecticides, nets, drugs, diagnostics. And, and this has made a, given us a lot of progress in the past few years. Uh, we are you know, having to now move forward and say, how do we optimize these interventions? How do we make sure that they're giving us the, the, uh, the best possible? At IVCC, they have identified 10 challenges that they would like to focus on strategically. And here is a list of them, but we will not read uh, all that. But we would like to ask our colleagues from IVCC, we could begin with Kristen, perhaps, on why these 10 challenges, and, and you know, could you just pick one or two of them and, and describe a little bit why you guys decided to select this as the primary uh, challenges that you, you're going to focus on? Kristen. Yeah, I mean, I think the list of 10 challenges does cover a, a wide a wide range of, of, of topics, um, all the way from you know, in, enhancing and creating better core interventions uh, for instance, you know, there's on here discussing um, creating new AIs for long-lasting nets, growing the IRS market, which involves you know, potentially figuring out how to make IRS more cost-effective, whether that's through products or through uh, uh, innovations in IRS delivery. We understand that um, in order to get to zero, it's not going to just be the core interventions. So we also have to look at things like how do we um, better use larviciding, identifying water bodies is on there. Um, how do we uh, affect outdoor transmission? So we realize that in addition to enhancing the core interventions, we're going to need to uh, fill the gap as it were. And then Really, the one of the biggest things is in order to do this, we need to keep our industry partners engaged. You know, there are very few uh, innovators out there um, in the vector control space, and we need to make sure that the players that we have stay and keep engaged because for most of them, the public health insecticide market is just a very small portion of you know, their, their overall um, agricultural programs. And really, uh, you know, it's looked at in, from, from the top sometimes as um, more of a, a, side, um, a, a, a side business that, you know, is, is taking, could be taking some resources away. So we have to make sure that even those folks at the top of those companies see the value in sticking with the industry with vector control and staying in, the, in this space. Uh, and I'll, um, I'll let Matthias add to that if, uh, if he wants to. Uh, thank you very much, Kristen. You did a very good job with uh, explaining this. One thing that I would like to come to come back to is when we have created this document, uh, Vector Control, 10 Challenges and 10 Solutions, that was uh, essentially as an advocacy piece. There, there are a lot of people out there who know very, very, very little about, uh, about vector control. And so, so through this document, that was uh, really an opportunity for IVCC to, to showcase a number of challenges but also to really to stress that for each one of those challenges, there are a number of, of, of solutions. Yeah. It may not be completely obvious you know, to, to all the people who, who, uh, who are thinking about malaria and about uh, you know, the, the, how to, to properly address malaria and breaking down to zero. But here through this, I mean, we were actually explaining how from an organization standpoint, we were addressing one of each one of those and what type of um, of solution we can we can put in place in order to address it? I think that actually, what's 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 really interesting with this list is, you know, as someone who works in vector control, uh, it is very rare that something like the market size of IRS is is mentioned as a challenge. You know, typically we are used to stuff like, oh, the biggest problem is insecticide resistance. The biggest problem is bed nets are not durable. Like, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. We think of things from a biological perspective. In the bigger th scheme of things, it's really beautiful that you guys are highlighting these other aspects, you know, such as keeping industry involved, keeping the, the market uh, growing. So, I, I think that would that would be really really nice to dig deeper into. And, and 
and, and other results, I'm just wondering whether you could, you know, begin by this this idea of keeping industry uh, involved. We've highlighted a few industry partners here with whom you work, the buyer, BASF, Mitsui, Sumitomo, Syngenta. Um, talk to us a little bit about why this is important. Okay. So to understand why it is important, maybe I should go back to, to just explaining, you know, how IVCC is working. IVCC is a very small organization. We are now 30 people within, within the organization. And so we are doing all the product development work in collaboration with partners. And this is where it becomes really fundamental that uh, organizations such as the one who are on the slide are keeping engaged into, uh, into the, the development of vector control product. Developing a vector control product requires not only, only a huge amount of scientific expertise, but it needs also a proper research and development platform in order to go through all the necessary steps about uh, screening active ingredients, uh, optimizing into a formulation, doing all the necessary uh, toxicological evaluation of the product, and finally, in-field evaluation, manufacturing scale-up, and in-market introduction. So, I mean, I'm just outlining, you know, some of the various steps. But this is uh, to, to show you that, uh, you know, th this is where we want, you know, BS, Bayer, Syngenta, Mitsui, Sumitomo, and all the other companies who have a role to play. And I'm here, I'm thinking about, you know, Vestagard, DCT, and so on, because they have a platform that, uh, that we can use. They, are, they have a know-how that is actually to, uh, helping to do this um, product yeah. development but not only to do the product development, but to take them to market and to make sure that they are making it accessible to people who are into malaria and the so, so essentially what you're saying is without an active industry involved, uh, being involved, all the scientific innovations or the great work happening in our laboratories, uh, Charles Wonji is, is here with us doing, doing uh, fantastic work on, in, on, on insecticide and sexual resistance. You guys are saying that without an active industry partnership, what we are doing or what the scientist is doing will probably not go that far. And at, at Ifakara Health Institute, we have a mission to improve people's health and well-being, but we are in the knowledge industry. Our knowledge, you are saying, will not make a lot of sense unless we have industry. Yeah, we need, we need the two arms. We need uh, all the work that the academic work can, can actually um, put together in order to understand the principle, but we need people who are also in capacity of integrating this knowledge into a proper product that can be taken up to scale. And this notion about scale is really important because without deployment at scale, you are not, not going to reach a malaria eradication. So, so if we were to extend this conversation, here is a good example of some information we have found about how this partnership of US with, with industry has led to uh, some incredible successes in recent years. Uh, here's a few, and, and first of all, to all our audience, on behalf of Sheila, myself, and everybody who runs these master classes, we just want to clarify that we have we are a political as a political as possible. We are not trying to promote any industry product here. We we really just trying to be to state the facts. But anyway, in recent years, we've seen introduction of new products, some of which are very effective, Actelic 300, Sumi Shield, Fludora Fusion. You know, Interceptor G2, there's just a study from Tanzania that, that has shown incredible success with, with Interceptor G2. I mean, you know, you, you have all this. We have a quote here from one of your partners uh, uh, at Bayer, um, who is, who's told us, you know, how grateful they are that, that IVCC invited them uh, to participate. And, and it seems to us that if IVCC had not initiated this, the indoor residual spraying product for fusion, which is now widely used, for example, would not have come to fruition. Can you guys talk a little bit about this? So each one of those projects and products that you have highlighted on the on, on, on this slide is having actually a quite quite a different in history within within IVCC. Not all of them have required you know, the same level of support. And that's what was the beauty of, of creating those partnership with the different companies. Depending upon the level of advancement of those uh, of those different uh, product development, we had had to contribute to different type of things. Uh, for in some cases, we had had to to uh, to help with a specific question related to formulation technology, to extend you know the the, the lifespan of uh, of the different product. 
from all for all the product development that was related to enabling a large scale field trial to assess the uh, the, the efficacy of of the product and uh, for some other that has that have been to to actually help with uh, the uh, regulatory process and uh, making sure that uh, the, the product is actually getting to market so yeah IBCC I think is is playing a, you know a key role for those product and I'm saying this because uh, uh, those company would probably um, have difficulties to to just do it on their own internally because uh, this is a question about uh, where they would mobilize their resources and if it would make it to to the priority um, priority development within their their, their own portfolio. Um, just want to ask my colleague Sheila, do you have any any specific question here? No, no, Fred, please go ahead. Okay, uh, brilliant. So, of, of course, um, uh, there's a lot of scientific evidence that, that these products work. Uh, uh, we would just like to use this opportunity to also thank all the scientists who have participated as partners uh, in evaluating these individual products, uh, to uh, thank also WHO partners for doing the, the PQ process, making sure that these products are now available. Um, uh, and, and, and again, to, to, say, to, say, to say thanks. Uh, to IVCC. Finally, as we move we move forward to this, I, I want to ask two quick questions uh, in succession here. Number one, one of the ways you do this is through something called vector expedited review vouchers that are given to companies. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit more broadly speaking uh, about the private sector involvement. So either of you guys uh, from IVCC side. Sorry, Fred Ross, you, do you want me to explain the, the principle yeah. of the vector yes. expedited review voucher? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so so the, the vector expedited review voucher is something that is not existing yet. I mean, this is something that, uh, that is in the making. We are, we are trying to develop this in the US legislation. This is a principle which, uh, which is uh, mimicking something that is already existing for the pharma industry in the, in the US legislation. For the pharma industry, this is called PRV, Priority Review Voucher. And this is a system which is existing within FDA. The basic principle is that uh, an, a, a company who would develop uh, a product for neglected uh, tropical diseases would actually get a voucher that they would be able to use. And this voucher could be used for one of their blockbuster product in order to give them a competitive advantage. So the, the basic system is to, to really give an incentive to companies to work and develop product for fair market where they, they know that they are not going to get a lot of return, but to through a priority voucher to be able to really to push one of their key product. This priority voucher can be applied either to their own pi pipeline or they can decide to sell it to a, another manufacturer. And so we are trying to do exactly the same thing, but this time not for pharmaceutical product, but for vector control product, hence vector expedited review voucher. This time, this is not with FDA, this is with EPA, the Environmental Protecting Agency, but the principle is staying the same. And, and a company who would develop a vector control product for you know, a, either malaria or, or neglected tropical diseases, would get a vector expedited review voucher that they would be applied to, to one of their blockbuster, let's say, you know, a, a herbicide for, for corn, for example, or they would be able to sell it. And this would give them, you know, a fantastic incentive to actually maintain their engagement of, within the development of vector control product and to, uh, to, uh, to put the necessary amount of resources, even if they know that they are going to, to have difficulty in having a high level of return on on investment. Thank you, thank you, thank you so so much. We we, we will move uh, quickly on this on these issues uh, beyond the industry partners with whom you work. Uh, there's also a lot of interest in bringing in uh, the private sector in, in the different countries. Uh, I believe that one of you at IVCC can can help us explain this, but also talk broadly about what role does IVCC play in. Uh, um, in creating the process of creating new routes uh, to market for these different products in different countries, using examples here, what role IVCC plays when it comes to working with the private sector, be it the mining industry, be it NGOs, and so on, which which has increasingly become an important part of vector control project. 
Thanks, Frederick. So just to follow up from what my, my colleagues have mentioned, the new rules to market came into existence within IBCC based on our assets portfolio and the work that we had done on the Next Generation IRS project. So in that project, we know around 2026, there were resistance was a problem, cost of insecticide was a problem. And in that, with the support from Unit 8, we worked with various country programs to be able to help gather evidence, also reduce cost of production of the insecticide or cost of purchase of insecticide. And starting from one product, we brought in three products at the end of the project. And as you mentioned, being a scientific community, you do know very well that in all the country programs, resistance is a problem. It's a problem. And within their strategic plans, they all have a great session which they have created as to how to manage resistance. And managing resistance means that having multiple products to be able to select from. And in that project, we had learned working with some a cross section of mining sector, hospitals, and other private entities. And we realized that they had an interest and they could contribute greatly to that. So post the project, we continue to engage part of our partners to see how can they expand what they are already doing either within their, or their immediate staff or their immediate environment. And as part of the process, again, this is just meeting the needs of the various national control programs. Because if you look at their strategies, each country has stated that within the next five years, they are going to embark on domestic resource mobilization drive within their strategy. So as part of the process, what IDCC is doing is how, how do we support these countries to be able to make come reality what they have stated in their program or in their strategy that they'll be able to expand. So helping them to build a kind of business plan, map out who are the private partners that exist in the country, in each of these countries, what role do they play are they already engaged in vector control activities, either for their staff or for their media community? If they are, how would they be able to, is there an opportunity for them to work with the National Malaria Control Program to expand what they're already doing? If they are not, selling the idea about the need to invest in vector control, particularly to reduce malaria, how will that generate return on investment for them? Because we do have practical examples where we can share with the Anglo Goal Ashanti Malaria Project where they have a lot of their cases earlier on was at a hospital was based on malaria. But when they introduced vector control intervention, including IRS, but beside them, the cases dropped and that gave them a return on investment. That gave the local community a healthy status to be able to engage in other communities to mobilize resources for themselves. So what we are doing this is a country led ownership that IBCC is just working with these countries to see how do we help you to make a case to business entities within your country. So one is, if it's a mining company, can the mining company invest in itself either in an IRS or other vector control products uh, interventions that are available to be able to scale up and reduce the, the malaria burden. We also know, again, if you look at all the funding streams, all the chunk of malaria funds are donor driven. Very, if you compare that to domestic resources, either the governments are doing their, their best, but I think donor and the governments alone is not enough to be able to send us to where we want to be in terms of malaria elimination and for that matter eradication. The need for private thank sector you. to be involved to support that. Yeah, thank thanks, you, Andrew. Andrew. Uh, Question. If I can chime in here, Andrew, could you please um, share examples of where we have domestic funding? So I can give you a classical example where in Ghana, we do have the Bermisu oil palm plantation that is using its own resources to invest in vector control, including IRS, to support their employees and their third parties on their mine uh, plantation. Again, if you also look at other countries, you have a very classic example in Zambia, where the government of Zambia itself is providing, is contributing a lot to the 
malaria control. Having said that, governments in Africa are also contributing to procurement of these uh, vector control tools that are coming to the market. Let's not forget that in most of the cases, government also provides the staff where they are investing in the staff to be able to stay on and be able to drive down these cases. A typical example I can also share with you from Ethiopia, where Ethiopia government itself is investing a huge amount of money into vector control to be able to drive the malaria cases in that country. Thank you very much, Andrew. Back to you, Fred. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Sheila. Uh, let's let's go back to the basics a little bit, and, and uh, we will ask uh, this question to our IBCC colleagues. But also, uh, we are happy to to listen in to to both Charles and Eric. Uh, we've used this slide a lot in our master classes, so we apologize to the participants if you've seen this a lot. <laughs> we know that IBCC uses this slide a lot to justify uh, the work that you do on, on insecticide. But one other piece of work that is rarely spoken about but came much earlier than this is the work by Tom Esau uh, from Tulane University. I think this was published in 2012, which demonstrated the power of insecticide treated bed nets, showing here that 99% of the lives saved at the time, and they used the life saved tool, the least model, that 99% of these gains were actually a result of, of, of ITNs. And for postgraduate students on the call, you might wanna you know, uh, go back to these early studies and just look at, look at that as well in addition to the uh, 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 to the Sami Bart, uh, Bart's paper. Uh, uh, Shara, did you want to, uh, to take this on or shall we? Do that. So, so I think that the, uh, an important question for us here is, you know, a lot of people ask, this is supposed to be innovative vector control consortium, but you are uh, still very much focused on ITNs and IRS. <clears throat> From the two papers that we've highlighted, we see the big justification here. Uh, please talk to us about your focus, uh, uh, how science justifies this focus, and why you guys think that it is still a, it is still reasonable to put most of the resources on 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 these two interventions, indoor residual spraying and insecticide treated bed nets, when a lot of people are saying, hey, it's time to move on. You know, we, we've got to find we've got to find something else. We, we know that you rely a lot on, on evidence such as provided by Samir Bhatt here. Uh, I've highlighted this example from from Tom Ersel, uh, a, a great piece of, of analysis uh, uh, done from IVCC, and, and we would like to also get get addition from from Charles and, and Eric here. Talk to us about the justification for staying involved with ITNs and IRS. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, so yes, we, we are focusing, um, I mean, let's be clear, IRS and ITM are very high in, into, into our priority list. The reason it is, is because uh, we, we know that those interventions are actually working. They know that they are delivering a huge level of impact in, uh, in population where they are being deployed. But we know as well that those interventions are being threatened and threatened by insecticide resistance. So this is why it is one of first IVCC priority is to make sure that we are actually maintaining the level of efficacy of those type of product. Hence, you know, the, the lineup of a new IRS product that we have supported, we are now, put, now um, kind of uh, finishing, you know, the work that we have been doing uh, we're on IRS and uh, the, the last uh, IRS products that are going to be launched and supported by IVCC. Are going to be hopefully uh, VEC 2500, which is uh, which is getting to the market now, and uh, we are hoping you know to get uh, to get Cyanendo as well. But now we are really focusing our resources on uh, the development of a new generation of bednet. This is critical because um, we we are starting you know to 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 see um, level of resistance affecting the level of efficacy of bednet, uh, and so we need uh, to get a new generation of bednet to overcome this challenge of resistance. But that being said, you know, IVCC is not overlooking any other technologies that could help uh, um, changing the, the, the way vector control is being performed. This is why, I mean, we are working on uh, preventing outdoor transmission through the work that we are doing on HSB. And I believe that we are going to discuss that in, in a lot more detail later on, but this is not all. I mean, we are actually doing some, some additional investigation related uh, 
to other type of uh, technology that uh, that could help in the in in this field including um, you know improving the application equipment that are being used in in IRS you know to further optimize the way this is uh, IRS is being uh, deployed but also in terms of uh, finding um, solution for automated surveillance uh, monitoring to to make sure that again I mean we, we can do a lot more uh, optimization of um, deployment of vector control product. I don't know if you want me to start with that. That's good. I just wanted to ask if uh, Charles and Eric, if you guys want to add anything uh, uh, to explain why the community should retain a reasonable level of, of effort uh, on IRS and ITS. Uh, Charles and Eric. Thanks, Fagos. I think it has to do also with the um, biology, bi uh, ecology, uh, behavior of the target, the vectors. We know that the major vectors are still biting indoors and the rest indoors. If you take Anopheles gambi, Anopheles finestus, this is still a common uh, behavior. Of course, we are noticing some level of shift in the field. And that's the reason why uh, either indoor is just spraying and particularly uh, bed nets are still very relevant in preventing transmission. And the modeling work also, uh, plus the exact data have both supported that these tools are still uh, very much the most likely to provide the protection uh, uh, that we expect. And uh, that's why we need to identify the challenges to this method that have worked. You could see on your picture uh, in the graph, the reduction in burden from 2000 to 2015, yeah, that, that has been dramatic. I think if we could work to continue that trend, we will uh, uh, be in a better position. Of course, there's a challenge of resistance, which is uh, actually creating the continued effectiveness. And that's why I think we can appreciate the work done by IVCC, because uh, if you, put, you, you provide more um, uh, insecticides uh, for IRS, and uh, better bed nets with new active ingredients that are not uh, uh, exposed to uh, existing uh, resistance mechanism, then the community will have more tools to fight uh, uh, malaria. And I think for me, the approach is really uh, a good one in focusing these two, but not just uh, rely on that. I think uh, Matthias explained very well that IVCC is looking beyond the two with uh, ATSB, which is really good target, uh, if you can target outdoor uh, transmission, that is something ongoing. But other partners are thinking about alternative methods. If you take about target malaria, working on gene drive, and uh, I don't think we will expect IVCC to do everything in the field of vector control, but they are doing uh, a great job in this field where we need new insecticides, to better manage resistance as we talk uh, about later. So overall, yes, the strategy seems fun to me, but uh, I will not be the one saying that it's one size fits all. We definitely need more tools, either for me or for the Thank you, Charles and Eric. Thank you, Eric. Hello, Eric, can you hear? I can hear you. Yeah, so um, I think uh, so Matthias and, uh, and Charles have summarized. You can speak up. Please speak up. Can you hear me now? Or closer to your microphone. Is this better Sorry, than you hear me now? Yeah, now that, yes. that, that's much better. Okay, great. Sorry, so, yeah. guys, there was a little dog behind me, so that's okay. This has already been well by both Matthias and Charles. Um, yes, so, the, so far, there's very good evidence that um, IRS and ITNs work. And based on what we are seeing so far, um, vector behavior hasn't shifted much. So the most efficient vectors, Anopheles finesses, Anopheles gambiases, are still feeding in those. And so um, indoor targeted um, interventions will still remain effective. And so um, with the resistance, there's, it's very important that we're able to get new um, actives against resistant computers and especially around bed nets and, and IRS. 
And then also with the shifting behavior in some places, um, I think it's very important that IVC is now shifting towards also being able to um, target outdoor biting. And so ATSBs will of course come in handy in, 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 in um, settings like this. But so far, I think IVC's focus is just as Charles has summarized it very good um, in terms of being able to maintain um, um, interventions in those and also um, trying to target outdoor um, uh, transporting mosquitoes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you all so, so much. So, I guess the, the, in, in summary here, what you guys are saying is that in terms of strategy, it is perfect. It, it's, it's a great idea that IVCC is staying involved with the two core interventions while at the same time staying open uh, to uh, the possibility of bringing in others. Uh, Charles also mentioned the fact that you know we have other partners uh, playing a role. Uh, you mentioned target malaria, for example, working on gene drives. So, so I think that, that, that explains it. But we're going to move forward to this now, and I'm going to invite my colleague, uh, 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 Shayla. Before that, I just want to mention real quick, one of the things that IDCC is working a lot on is, is um, energizing the market, if you like, making sure that the market for vector control is active. People are, uh, hey, help on Shayla. Shayla, can you guys mute that individual? Uh, yeah, all. Dear friends, we request that you stay muted. Uh, whenever you join, it makes it easier for us. Uh, it's often said that public health has no money, at least. <laughs> That's what some people say. But uh, uh, chemical industry or pharmaceutical industry don't have a very good name always. In, 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 I mean, maybe I'm wrong. You know. we, we've seen great examples here of how IVCC is engaged with the industry uh, to, to allow us to see the great side and the great value. But in addition to that, there's also this, this idea of making sure that the market is active and we will be speaking a lot about that. I would like to invite Shayla, my colleague, uh, to continue with the conversation from here. Shayla, please. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Perhaps I should turn this to Kristen. Um, so the new NETS project, um, uh, last time we had a discussion around the new NETS project, but perhaps you could just remind us, Kristen, um, on what, like on the overall overview of the objective of the new NETS project and where we are um, thus far. So we note that it has three components around the evaluation of the new NETS um, as well as the operational aspects and randomized control trials. So please just take us just a brief summary of what it is all about and where we are. Sure. Um, so the, the new NAS project uh, started in 2018. It's a, an initiative that was established by Unitaid uh, and Global Fund um, uh, with support from uh, the President's Malaria Initiative and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, to IVCC that then works with other partners um, to catalyze the market for the introduction of next generation nets. Um, and when I speak of next generation nets, I'm talking about those with uh, two active ingredients. So that would be a pyrethroid plus another insecticide. So um, in this case, we're not talking about the PBO nets, we're talking about uh, specifically here, the Interceptor G2 with um, the pyrethroid and chlorphenopyr and the Royal Guard with the pyrethroid and pyroprostin. And I would really say there are, are, are four components um, to the project, not just sort of the three you see up here, but the fourth, the big one really is sort of that market shaping component um, that enables us to get these nets out. So um, it, we, we, through the new nets project, we set up a system of co-payment for these products to bring the prices down to make them affordable to the countries with in-country budgets so that uh, their use uh, could be expanded within these pilots, the op both the operational pilots and the evaluation pilots, but also um, through um, work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through MedAccess, uh, there was a volume guarantee set up, which allowed us to um, uh, have as the volumes increased and um, we were able to have the, the price of the net reduced. So as your numbers grow and you're able to sell more nets, the price comes down. So that along with the copay 
Uh, it was really a key driver in expanding market access for these countries to the nets, enabling us to do all of these pilots. And through those pilots, we chose about five of them, as you see here, to gather more, um, more, more data on uh, the effectiveness of the nets in different settings, different malaria endemicities, different resistance settings, different you know, patterns of use. And then the efficacy data, of course, came from the randomized controlled trials. Uh, the Tanzania trial is not directly under NMP. That was supported by MRC uh, Welcome and the Gates Foundation. Uh, but the Benin trial, uh, which uh, was fully under NMP, um, is also needed, the two of them together, to hopefully um, this summer submit that data to VCAG. And then, uh, fingers crossed, this fall, after it's reviewed by VCAG, we will um, be getting some sort of policy recommendation from WHO on these nets that would then allow uh, for more uh, broad standardized procurement of the nets. Thank you. And we're, and we're basically in the last year, I should note, so 2022. Um, so the new nets project does end this year. Uh, but um, in order to sort of bridge that gap between when VCAG might come with a policy recommendation for WHO, um, and the end of the project, there is, uh, under the Global Fund, uh, something called the Net Transition Initiative, which will help uh, bridge that gap and continue sort of those co-payments that were started under NMP to continue to allow countries uh, to, procure, um, to procure nets for their current upcoming campaigns, in addition to generating additional evidence on how these new nets fit into uh, a broader scheme of other um, resistance management tools that countries might have. Yeah, Kristen, do you foresee a, a situation where the standard pyrethroid only nets would be phased out? Um, there, there, where are we are going? Yeah. there are already a few countries um, that we know of that have said, we do not want standard nets anymore. Um, Malawi has made that decision, Burkina Faso has made that decision. Um, so I don't think necessarily it will be everywhere. Um, there may still be countries that see that they have places where uh, the pyrethroid nets are still working, that their resistance problems aren't that great. But we do know we've seen it already in some countries, uh, which I think is, is, is great. Um, as we know, the even PBO nets are more expensive than standard nets, but I think um, having those countries stand up and say, you know, our resistance data shows that any net that's not a pyrethroid net that's either a PBO or an X generation with the, you know, the IG2 or Royal Guard is doing better. Um, we want those nets instead. I think that's, that's great. And I, I do foresee more countries potentially going that route. Fantastic. Over to you, Fred. No, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, just a quick there. Uh, Kristen, last week, two weeks ago, we had a, a conversation with our partners here and WHO joined them. And uh, we did uh, uh, um, observe that there is already a recommendation for PBO nets, a fairly clear recommendation for PBO nets on when they can be used. So when you say that uh, uh, we are expecting a recommendation, can you just clarify that that is with regard to the new nets, not the PBO nets? Correct. So right okay. now, the, the new nets, um, the Interceptor G2 and the Royal Guard, they have a PQ listing, but yeah. it's sort of a, uh, their grandfa a grandfathered listing in that they were uh, approved under the HUPE system uh, as pyrethroid nets. So they weren't approved as being better than a pyrethroid net. They were approved as meeting the standard of a pyrethroid net. And that's how they um, got on the pre-qualification list. But as we know, WHO now has uh, sort of three categories of net classes, your standard yeah. pyrethroid nets, nets that um, are more effective against pyrethroid resistant mosquitoes through increased mortality, and then nets that are more effective against resistant mosquitoes by reducing fecundity. So IG2 falls in the second category of increased mortality against resistant mosquitoes, Royal Guard falls to that third category. And um, right now, there's a no formal policy recommendation on the Interceptor G2 or Royal Guard um, as they were listed as being part of that first category. 
No, that's that's a nice clarification, a fantastic clarification there. We're going to move this uh, forward. And Fred, again, is um, there? Fred, Go ahead. Just, yeah, just before we move on. Yeah. So, um, we and last time during the last masterclass, we got this comment around also focusing on the Asian countries, the Americas, and we note here that um, we don't have any countries um, representing from those regions, Kristen. Um, is there a particular reason for this? So the new, I mean, the new NETS was mostly focused on project was mostly focused on Africa. I, I think um, primarily because this is where the resistance problem is greatest. Um, I think there's uh, definitely still more pyrethroid susceptibility um, in the Americas and in um, the Asia Pacific region uh, currently. So where we focus where the need is, is sort of the greatest in terms of immediate need for um, resistance breaking tools. Great. Good. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. And uh, we will skip this. Uh, we had a question here, but you already mentioned that the new NETS uh, program is coming to an end and that we will be transitioning. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. The other thing that we, we just want, want you to talk a little bit uh, um, briefly about is the question of the data types. Mm -hmm. So the new NETS program covered a lot of countries, but the RCTs were done in just two countries in Benin and Tanzania. Uh, uh, from the initial collections, you already have quite a bit of this data. Um, what, you, what you see here, what you call the difference in difference comparisons. Uh, and now we also start to see the data from the RCT. So talk to us a little bit about how these different data sets play in, why the, it was important to do the, that observational scale up uh, in addition to the RCTs, how are countries uh, 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 interpreting this data, how useful is it for us in the uptake of the new nets going forward? Sure. So the RCTs are, 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 are you know, ideal and, and the perfect gold standard to get the effectiveness uh, uh, sorry, the efficacy. Let's get the, let's get these words straight. The efficacy of the nets. <laughs> so um, yeah. we we know under the very controlled conditions in very specific settings, we can understand you know how much better these nets do than a standard net. Right. We'll get that answer for Tanzania, and we'll you know we have that answer for Tanzania, and we'll be getting that answer for Benin. But that doesn't really. And you know that's taking place where there's really controlled distribution. We know everybody in the study area is getting the study net. We've tr done campaigns to make sure everybody uses those nets. Um, you know we're we're going around doing our surveys, reinforcing that, and it's it's ideal conditions. What we also want to understand though is not in those two countries, but in other places in Africa under different malaria endemicities, different resistance profiles, maybe where usage isn't the best for various reasons or access isn't great. What is the effectiveness of the net under real world conditions? You know, countries always wanna know, great, that was seen in Tanzania, but is it gonna work here? We have different vectors. You know, we have different behaviors of the population. And so that's where the effectiveness pilots come in. So this is you know, real world conditions. And I think it's useful to have both uh, because it, there, there can be, while, while an, you, know, you might see an effect in the uh, randomized control trial, how big or small that effect might be could vary based on the baseline conditions in different countries. Um, so here's results, preliminary results from three of our effectiveness pilot countries, um, looking at the difference uh, between the either um, the, stand, the, the standard nets and in interceptor G2 or the standard nets in Royal Guard. And in some cases, we also uh, were able to compare the standard nets to PBO nets or in Rwanda, the standard nets to uh, a district that uh, put out standard nets and also did IRS. What we see basically across the board is that you know, any, after any mass distribution campaign, uh, we see increased bed net use and decreases in malaria transmission, regardless of nets. So this is where you, you, um, you see that a pyrethroid net is still, still working in the sense that there is some, they are having some impact. However, I think across the board, we can clearly say that in areas of moderate to high transmission where there are pyrethroid resistant vectors, 
any of the new types of nets, at least uh, you know, out through the first year uh, in some instances. Um, and uh, we have data for out to the second year in a couple countries already that we that they do seem to be more effective at controlling malaria than the standard nets alone. So yes, any net is going to make an impact, but these next generation new types of nets, Interceptor G2, PBO, Royal Guard in Mozambique um, still seem to be doing better than the standard nets. Now this is uh, particularly the Mozambique data. I know it, folks are gonna, who have read the Tanzania study might see that this is slightly different than the Tanzania results. Um, the Royal Guard don't appear to be doing as well as the IG2, but they do still appear to be doing substantially better um, here in Mozambique than the um, standard nets. So again, this could come down to, and we don't know what's gonna happen in Benin, but this could come down to the vectors that are present. If there's any cross resistance in that vector population between paraproxifen and pyrethroids, uh, is there something about the net use in, uh, and behaviors in the area? We know in the Tanzania study, net there, by the end of the study, there weren't very many Royal Guard nets around. Maybe there's better retention and use here in Mozambique. And so I think this is particularly why the effectiveness yeah. pilots are important because it does show that you know, the, the randomized control trials, while they're, they're great, can't tell you everything, and especially about how a particular net's going to do in your setting. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so, so much for that, uh, that this fantastic explanation. We can do two or three RCTs, but we cannot do them in every country. It is important that countries are gathering data as they implement these interventions that provides the observational data that can be used for context-specific decisions. And here are in, uh, fantastic examples from Rwanda, Burkina Faso, and, and Mozambique with, with some of these examples. I would like to bring in um, uh, our colleagues, Charles and, and Eric here. Last week, two weeks ago, we had a, a conversation with uh, Natasha Protopopov, uh, Natasha, uh, our colleague uh, Dr. Natasha uh, from uh, London School and, 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 and Tanzania. Uh, a fantastic study by uh, Jacqueline Mosha and her colleagues. We are hoping that we will have Jacqueline on one of our master classes soon. She's been recommended highly by, by several people. And we, uh, Jacqueline, in case you're listening, we are coming after you. So uh, we would like to have a review, a broad scale review. Uh, by Charles and, and Eric on, on, on these multiple studies. So here we start. Here's the first one, perhaps the best net known so far, Interceptor G2. Uh, great results from Tanzania in an area that has a lot of anopheles finesters. Uh, broadly speaking, from a clinical perspective, much better than even the, the, much better than anything we've seen uh, before. We've up to, you can see the odds there, 47, 66, 45, two years down the line. A, a great result. We see here also um, a study from Tanzania again by the same group, a, a great work by uh, Mark Roland and colleagues and Natasha and colleagues uh, they're doing uh, here. And also another study uh, from uh, Uganda. These were PBO studies. These were not new net uh, projects. Both of them demonstrated great improvements compared to, to pyrethroids, even though in these cases, uh, uh, you, there was no evidence that they were lasting as long. Uh, at least the PBO is not lasting uh, lasting as long um, uh, in, in the Uganda trial. You can see, but 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 again, you, you see here the odds ratios, great improvements compared to to pyrethroid uh, nets. The last one is the uh, the study from Burkina Faso. Uh, all is a duo. This is a a, um, a proxy and bad net. Um, twelve percent improvement, uh, not not as great as the other, but Burkina Faso is kind kind of special when it comes to resistance. <laughs> you guys can talk about that if you like. We would like to get from you guys expert opinion on these three studies combined, the on these four studies, the IG two study, the uh, actually the I the interceptor G two study also included Royal Guard, so and under PBO net, so that was fairly comprehensive. The Burkina one and, and, and the study in Uganda. What are your thoughts? And in relation to the question Shayla asked earlier, should we now face out standard pyrethroid bed nets? Uh, what do you think these studies represent for vector control going forward? So we can start with you, Charles, and then Eric, and then we can revert back to our IVCC colleagues. Charles, please. Thank you, Fuegos. 
And I will say that uh, these studies are quite consistent in that the new nets are working better and uh, helping to reduce malaria burden than the standard net. Uh, if we start with the uh, uh, IG2, the recent paper uh, for the randomized control trial, yeah, and you could clearly see that um, IG2 work better. And we need to also understand how uh, uh, clofenal P work. Clofenal P actually is bioactivated by cytochrome P450s. So it could actually happen because those parietary resistant mosquitoes, some, most of them are resistant by expressing a lot of P450s. And uh, particularly in, in the case of Anopheles funestus, which was the major species in um, Tanzania, we, I think it was about 90%, 95%, 94%, 94% uh, yeah. yes, funestus. And this uh, species, uh, mainly develop resistance through overexpression of P450s that actually um, mosquito is using to bioactivate uh, chlorophenol P to make chlorophenol P more lethal. So I, I, I'm saying this uh, as uh, an assumption. We have, we have to uh, agree here, no studies yet, but it's well possible that the, 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 the tools or the the the, the 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 tools that mosquitoes are using to become resistant to parietroid is making it more susceptible to clofenap which actually will make ig2 a bit more efficient in populations where you have unique or major mechanisms of resistance through p450s that's for that's that an case. important point um, please repeat that charles i'm saying that in because clofenap p uh, works by being bioactivated by cytochrome P450s, which for some species like Anopheles finestris is also the enzyme families uh, conferring resistance. So uh, in, in the case of Tanzania, most mosquitoes there will overexpress P450s to resist against parichroate. But if you expose these populations to chlorophenol P, actually they will uh, transform chlorophenol P to the lethal form, making them more susceptible. That is one assumption why this has been working well in that uh, case. But it's not always the case elsewhere. Burkina Faso is the situation where actually the resistance profile is more complex, more mechanisms, KGR, uh, cytochrome P450, DSTs, and even um, the subgenes recently detected. So when you have a situation like that, the same profile may not work. That's why the benefit from using this novel net may not be to the same extent, although it's still beneficial. Therefore, if you ask my opinion, where we should move, we should go, I would say uh, novel net, PBO net, we, we, I will advocate using them uh, more than the standard net. The final point we make is regarding the work in um, uh, Uganda or done before in Tanzania also for Oliset Plus or PBO net. Again, these uh, studies show that those nets were more efficient than standard nets. That's because we know clearly that uh, metabolic resistance is playing a major role and mostly because mosquitoes now are able to overexpress a lot of P450s. So if you have a net that can block the action of these uh, P450s. So you will end up inducing a greater level of mortality, though reducing malaria transmission. So I think scientifically, we really see why this uh, net, this uh, uh, net have performed better in certain places. But again, I will join uh, the opinion mentioned earlier that that is the result for randomized concurrent trial. It's also interesting that countries themselves are collecting data uh, that we actually strengthen their hands. Because I know, for example, some countries, when they go to, uh, to, to ask a global fund, we need new nets. Sometimes they don't have evidence for that. If they collect some net, they have new nets now. If they could collect data really showing that in areas of standard net, uh, we have more transmission than the area of uh, PBO or uh, interceptor that will help them themselves to establish the, the, the future direction. Over to you. 
incredible explanation there. Thank you so, so much, Charles, for coming in uh, to, to do a uh, you know, broad uh, stroke overview of all these studies uh, combined. Uh, Eric, can you pick this up and, and just, you know, Charles mentioned here that we will need local evidence that different countries need to use that evidence to make their own decisions on whether this, uh, what they should do in those contexts. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so that, that's actually a really good point. So um, I'm just going to give an example of um, of what's happening in Kenya right now. So um, there are two. So so the the most of malaria transmission in in Kenya is actually in Western Kenya, where we have like um, eight counties. Two, uh, three of those eight counties currently have PBO nets, and so at the moment, the ministry has been thinking about scaling up PBO nets to all of the eight counties. However, there's, there's a bigger challenge that, that we have to think about. So from a control perspective, um, mostly um, NMCPs have one pot and that pot is limited. So there, there's, there's going to be that battle of whether we go for new nets or do we retain the same old ITNs, but then ensure that we have a bigger coverage. So what's the, what's the more important question here? That's something we need to think about. But as, as Charles mentioned earlier on, um, the new nets are definitely much, much better given the evidence that we see from these papers that we just portrayed. So with, with parathroid, um, uh, sorry, with P450 driven insecticide resistance, definitely PBO nets will perform very well. And now we see that um, um, the, the, um, um, uh, the dual active combination nets, so for example, the um, I intercepted G2 performs very well in places where you have resistance. So definitely in places where you have resistance, you want to try and give them um, the combination nets and PBO nets if possible. But I think that in terms of maintaining coverage, there, there's, a, there's a balancing act that, that NMCPs have to do. Um, and this is going to be basically uh, something that each country will have to think about based on its burden, based on um, based on its resistance profiles, based, based on its resistance profiles. So for every single country, I think this is uh, where it becomes very important to collect data. It becomes very important to determine what sort of resistance levels are in different parts of the country. And it also becomes very important to figure out what interventions are going to be needed in different parts of the country, depending on the burden and also depending on the resistance profiles. If I can add something there, Fagos. Yes, uh, because Eric mentioned something very vital there that uh, is not one size fits all, even at the country level, and that uh, NMCPs and partners need to gather data to guide the choice and distribution of the nets. I will give the example of Cameroon, where the next uh, the mass distribution of 2022 actually we include three types of nets: parathroid only in area of moderate resistance um, uh, at. Um, Intercept G2 and the PBO net, depending on the level of resistance. And I think countries we need to be doing that more, which means that Malaya surveillance is important. And uh, even including data from discrete level. And uh, you know, Fregos, that we are involved in some initiative in uh, providing uh, trainings even to discrete uh, health worker to uh, generate data on resistance. That is the future. A, a, um, a fine scale mapping of the resistance level to guide. Uh, um, uh, information, a decision at the, for the NCP for distributing the, those nets, which will be more relevant in the local context. I am very, very encouraged uh, to hear this conversation between IVCC, Charles Wonji, Eric Ochomo, uh, the, the way you express the, 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 you know, the, the science behind it, but also what countries need to do. You know, sometimes from Global Fund, you hear statements such as, hey, You've got to scale out, scale back nets from certain parts of the country, and and, and you say, hey, it's not just nets; it's pyrethroid nets, it's PBO nets, it's new nets. All this must come into play. The point that is context specific. People should collect data, like Christian was saying. A uh, uh, great, great. You bring in cost here, and I want to bring this back to Sheila to talk about cost together with our IPCC colleagues. How cost plays uh, into this? Uh, back to you, Sheila. Yeah, thank you, Fred Ross. I think th that that discussion really leads beautifully into the question on cost. Because imagine you're at the N NMCP and you see this data that clofenapyr nets are actually the best, you'd want to go for them. 
but they're actually the most expensive compared to the others. So Andrew, um, perhaps you could tell us what IVCC is doing to reduce the costs of this um, net, please. Yeah, thanks, thanks Stila. So you realize from what uh, Christine has spoken about uh, part of the new net project, that's what we call the co-payment mechanism, which is in place So this new net based on their current existing budget, where co-payment from that we are getting from global funds looking into the future we are hoping that once the, the, the policy recommendation is made the volumes will increase and once the volumes increases it will hopefully come to other closer to the current budgets that they are uh, procuring them at so that's what we are looking at and i'm sure Christian again have mentioned that as the new net project comes to an end, there's what we say. Drew, you're muted. You're muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I was. Just to go back to what I said, I said I was just making reference to what Kristen has said earlier on, and then she did mention about the fact that there's in the new net project, we are provided a co-payment mechanism. And within the co-payment mechanism, the point what we are looking at is what is the current country budget per net? And then what is the difference in price now? So the co-payment mechanism goes in to pay the difference. So currently within the project, the current the projects are, the countries are procuring the nets closer to what they would have procured with uh, either this uh, PDO net or other parental net that they are using. Hoping that once the policy recommendation comes in towards the end of the project, the volumes would have increased and that would drive down uh, the prices. As more, then there would also be that kind of competition. And you know definitely once there's competition, it also had an effect on the price. And that's why we are looking at uh, into the future on that. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And, and your comments in the chat, you're talking about task incentives. Um, shed some more light on that, please. So, yes, uh, one of the things we're looking at in the private sector is because uh, there are different models that we are looking at. There are, com there are private companies where they are investing their own resources into other uh, corporate social responsibility or to support the various national malaria control programs. What we are looking at is to, would a country be able, because we know that when these products are imported, in some cases, because they are private entities, government still puts a lot of tax on them, and that affects how they'll be able to scale up. So the question we are looking at is, would government be able to provide a kind of tax incentives or tax havens for the private companies, a kind of tax waiver to be able to support private companies to pick up that? One other thing we're also looking at is, I know some countries are looking at pest control organization that already have the capacity. Would there be an opportunity for them to provide that kind of incentive from government sector as part of its contribution to the scale up of vector control to be able to help more partners to pick up IRS and support within the uh, National Marine Control Strategic Framework? Fred. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. So uh, it's, I can't help but, uh, well, it's interesting the level of optimism that this community has about prices. Uh, there's a, you know, there's this a great assumption that as, 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 as production gets scaled up, the prices will go down. Now, if you're talking to industry, I imagine that they wish that the prices don't go down too much because you want to keep industry engaged. And, and IVCC has done incredible work getting, in IVC, getting industry engaged. Now the industry is engaged and now you're saying, let's drive down the prices. So Kristen, Andrew, uh, 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 um, Matthias, 
how do these conversations go on between countries, industry, IVCC? How do you get the quality, especially with the resistance and the prices? Where do we strike a balance? When will we reach an equilibrium? It's a multifaceted question. Yeah, I think I, I just want to start. Oh, go ahead. No, please go ahead. I'll come in. I was just going to start by saying that I think we got to a place a few years back, you know, with pyrethroid nets where prices got unsustainably low for some manufacturers. The the competition aspect of it was sort of driving you know, break net, you know, prices down to either break even or below. I mean, it got it got a little bit unrealistic. So I think in that sense, um, and I, I think it's gotten you know more realistic in the last few years. And we know that base prices with um, with of, of of oil, dr you know, drive a lot of the plastic component. So there is a there is a base price below you know which. The, you know, manufacturers can't be losing money on nets. And I think uh, we, we need to sort of just recalibrate to, to, to understand that. Um, but uh, from there, you know, we have seen with the uptake of PBO nets in countries that countries are willing to pay a little more for a net that provides protection against pyrethroid resistant mosquitoes. We see this um, from the donors as well in the PMI budgets and in the global fund budgets. So from that perspective, we know um, that the price of a PBO net is fairly acceptable. Um, and as Andrew, I think, put in the comments, you know, we're trying to drive the new net prices as close by the end of these interventions, as close to that as possible. Um, it may not always get that low, but there's at least, um, you know, a, a sense of, I think, an area of pricing that we can agree, um, and as, as a global community, we're starting to agree is is acceptable for um, for the for procurement of a you know better than standard net. So just put that out there as context first. Thank you, Kristen. If I can add um, a couple of things, I mean, Fred Rose, at the beginning of this conversation, you were asking, you know, that that maybe the uh, our environment is uh, is too. Uh, optimistic in terms of our capacity of driving prices down. But I mean, we, we have this experience already and we have done this uh, through the engineer program and we have seen, you know, through this, uh, the, this, uh, this entire program um, on the, the introduction of third generation IRS into the marketplace, that it was actually possible to drive the prices down. And through you know a, a number of mechanisms that uh, that have been already explained by uh, by Kristen and by uh, by Andrew. But one thing that is uh, that is probably you know giving the most incentive to uh, to to the manufacturer to drive the prices down is actually by uh, um, incentivizing competition into this marketplace, and by getting them really to uh, to compete on on this. And this is uh, this is a, a fantastic element you know to uh, to really bring prices down but the other thing that i wanted to mention is that uh, um, yes of course you know, manufacturers are expecting and are enjoying to to receive you know a good level of margin on the level of pro on the products that they are selling but that's not the only thing that they are looking at and one thing that we have discovered through our interaction with uh, with, with 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 manufacturer is that they also want predictability they want to, to, to make sure that when they are going to produce uh, their product, they will be able you know, to, to actually have a proper flow from, their, from their, their manufacturing base to where those products are going to be delivered. And IVCC has worked with, uh, with a lot of partners in order to, to facilitate uh, this modeling and to facilitate uh, this flow and to give them you know, this level of reassurance that when they will launch production, they will be able to actually uh, sell this. And all this is actually helping the process of bringing the prices down, making the product more acceptable, increasing the volume, and, and so being in, in really into, into a positive, uh, into a positive uh, spin, you know, to, to really uh, allow those, uh, those innovative products, uh, those life-saving products to get to market, to really increase volume and to, to get the prices down. So maybe Thank you guys. if so, I could so, just add a little bit to what... Yeah, very quickly, Andrew, and then we, we can move yeah. on. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to add another 
just build uh, in addition to what uh, Matthias just said. So we currently are supporting all the countries in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of IS look based on the country's IRM strategy. What product do they want to use in their next pre cycle if it is in terms of IRS? So you will find a situation where we would assist whether it's PMI or it is Global Fund or it is UNDP who is, provide, who is providing procurement support. We have a global consolidation of a global forecast based on which can, a country, the product a country wants to use. Then we can we assess the, the manufacturers. Clearly close to six months or eight months down the line, we provide this forecast for them. And that also helps to increase the ability to be able to predict. And once you're able to predict, I think it also contributing to the price stability and reduction that we're talking about. Thanks. And just, just before before we go to the next uh, topic, uh, just to say that in the chat, David Maguire has put more information on it. So I would recommend um, uh, people on the line to, to read what he said. Great, and, and also a, a comment there by, uh, by Natasha about how this relates to the durability of, uh, of ITNs. You know, these are the things that, at least from vector control perspective, we rarely see. They are, they are almost intangible, you know, the, the pricing, the markets, how all this play out in, into the, you know, transforming an intervention that is, that is efficacious into being an intervention that is effective. So thank you guys so, so much uh, for that. Our colleague Charles will, uh, drop at some point, but uh, maybe come back or, or, or not. And, and I just want to say thanks to to him uh, so far for 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 that conversation. Let's let's move on very quickly. Uh, I think Kristen mentioned this already. A lot of these uh, products were already pre-qualified before. Uh, to see you, uh, allow me to show you where hello, you want to see. Where next? Where hello. Sir. What about you? Doesn't matter. Huh? Good morning. Yes, so uh, this is the, the current uh, PQ listing for the NETS and the IRS product. Uh, a lot of these were already in place uh, uh, way before the new NETS uh, project and it's because they were listed as, as simply as pirated NETS, so they carry pirated that's, that's, that's a point that was already, was already covered well by, by Kristen. Uh, we would like to recognize uh, that a lot of improvements taking place in the net industry. So it's not just about insecticide itself, but there's a, a lot of developments uh, going on here. This is an interest, a good example from Liverpool, um, uh, uh, where uh, you know the, you demo, they've demonstrated mosquitoes are approaching from the top and now asking the question of what if you treated just certain surfaces of the badness. We have work from uh, uh, our Harvard colleagues here using. Um, uh, pharmaceutical uh, drugs uh, to, to kill malaria uh, parasites in there. Um, uh, okay, so we're looking forward to those as well. And I think at this stage we would like to discuss a little bit about packaging and hand this over to Michelle. Yeah, sorry, it took me a while to unmute. Um, so, Matthias, um, perhaps let's shift the conversation a bit to waste management. Um, and what IVCC is doing in terms of, you know, ensuring that um, we are environmental friendly. Um, so is there perhaps um, thinking around new packaging of bed nets from plastic, shifting from plastic to something more environmentally friendly? Thank you, thank you for this question. Um, this is actually a topic which is really growing up in terms of priority within within our thinking, in terms of how do we integrate this notion within within the way we are developing our product. So for BedNet, I mean, I'm I'm not the best person, you know, to uh, to elaborate on this. I mean, I know that there are some people who are really thinking in terms of uh, how we can we can reduce uh, the level of packaging, reducing the amount of plastic that uh, that are going to end up likely into the environment. There is a lot of question also about uh, you know collecting back uh, the, the the product, but um, uh, what I can do is not so much on Betnet, but on on a product such as ATSB. Uh, what I can share with this uh, this community is to say that uh, that this is something that that is entering into our line of of uh, thinking and uh, and um, 
product development. Right now, for the time being, I mean, we are focusing on, the, on demonstrating the public health value of the product or with a product design, which we know have too much plastic built into it. But there is a, a parallel track that is being investigated with uh, the, the manufacturer of the ATSB in order to drastically reduce uh, this level of plastic and really all the components of it, meaning the plastic of the bait station itself, but there are also all the packaging around it and being able you know, to, uh, to reduce uh, the, the number of outer layers that are needed for the time being you know, to be able to ship ATSB from one location to the other. So what you have highlighted is really becoming front and center into, uh, into, our, into our thinking, into the product development process. And uh, we are hoping that, uh, that this is really going to materialize into uh, you know, a lot less plastics in, out, I mean, in the environment. But um, not only plastic, I mean, we are here dealing with, um, with insecticides, we need to make sure and ensure the fate of, the, of those insecticides. Hence, we are thinking about, you know, what could be ways to actually collect the different items and to dispose of them safely. Over. Thank you, thank you. Go ahead, Shira. Um, and no questions, Fred. Um, you can change. No, yeah. no, I just wanted to ask whether we have anybody in the audience from the countries uh, uh, and who can talk to us a little bit about how much of a problem this is. I mean, I know that in some countries, plastics have been banned already. So do we have anybody uh, in the chat who, I mean, feel free to unmute yourself and just talk to us a little bit whether this is a consideration for NMCPs, uh, how bad is the package? Do you have anyone? Yeah? Yeah. Um, good, af good afternoon, everybody. This is Udoka from Enugu, Good Nigeria. afternoon, Udoka. Go ahead, yes. Yeah. Um, actually, I, 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 I'm very grateful for um, what is in the screen right now. Because obviously, of course, you know, Nigeria is relatively large. And this is quite a huge, huge problem for us. You know, when we talk about these plastics, um, picture here depicts exactly what is happening in most of our countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, there is no ban on this in Nigeria. And it is even, I'm sure, our case may be larger than what we have in Nairobi. So I think it's important that we begin to look at this from a wider perspective because it's also country, it's not just in the malaria aspect. When you talk about aboviruses and others, you know, this is also a huge issue for other vectors like Aedes for breeding. So it's important we actually look at this and then all countries come up with something together to actually look at how to curb this. It's a fact affecting a whole lot of this, including the aquatic habitat. So when I saw this, I was, I mean, we need to give huge kudos to the person who is using this to actually um, bring about awareness about what this is actually doing. And I'm sure that even those at the NMEP, when they see things like this, I think everybody begins to think in the direction of what do we start doing as individuals and as a country as a region and as a people to actually cope this. I think I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a great uh, perspective from, from, from one of our countries. Uh, we're going to move now. Let's talk a little bit about indoor residual spraying from my perspective. And then after that, we'll talk about resistance management and then ATSB, and that will be the, the, the end of it. IRS, very, very effective, one of the most effective interventions. Uh, and here we have data from South Africa, actually. Uh, our colleague Rajendra, uh, who used to be at the NM South African NMC for a long time, will remember this. Uh, fantastic demonstration of how indoor residual spraying uh, can work to reduce malaria. In some cases, it would make vectors disappear. Uh, unfortunately, uh, from the evidence that you see, uh, uh, whereas we have a lot of adoption for ITNs, the adoption, the, the, the coverage for IRS has remained kind of stagnant. This is a topic we've discussed in multiple master classes before. You see this great work by, uh, by, by uh, uh, Juliana Tangena. Uh, we see this data also from IVCC work, 
uh, with the, uh, with the en en engineers, <laughs> if I may say that, where you, you see that when the, the specific active ingredient was changed from pyrethroids to the non-pyrethroids, you kind of no longer see the growth in IRS uh, that, that we want to see. And I think that's those are important concerns that we, we have to look at. And we are very grateful that IVCC and partners are working here to make sure that the, an intervention such as IRS that is as impactful as has been seen in places like, like South Africa and many other places, that that intervention can be saved, kind of. So please talk to us a little bit broadly speaking for now. What are you doing in the space of improving indoor residual spray as a public health intervention? I guess I, I'll, I'll start there. Um, you know, we, you, you have it up here. Um, we were approaching this from a number of angles. I mean, the, 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 the cost of IRS is probably, even though we know it's cost effective and has um, great efficacy, as you've shown, the overall cost of IRS is something that appears to be a stumbling block for, for many programs. And it's, you know, one of the main reasons is it's an annual intervention. Uh, as opposed to sort of that the three-year lifespan of a net. But um, what we're doing is trying to make our, or through formulation, our sprays last longer. Um, can we actually get a IRS product that lasts a full year uh, or longer? Uh, wouldn't that be, um, you know, fantastic and innovative if we actually didn't have to spray if uh, once a year, if a product could last almost two years? Um, is there a way we can go about applying IRS uh, that makes it less costly and more efficient? Is there a way that we can get um, uh, the, the implementers to not just be you know, these sort of armies that are mobilized from a high level, but maybe through, and, and Andrew can talk about this, through some of these new routes to market, some other private sector uh, companies that can help come in and implement IRS or have it be more of a community-based program? Are there ways we can uh, create application te technology that's helpful for, uh, for companies or communities to do IRS themselves uh, that would allow uh, for cost savings? And so I think uh, by tackling it in a number of ways, uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, continue to maintain the IRS coverage that we have now, uh, but also hopefully expand it. Um, you know, as, as I, I mentioned earlier, people often compare it to nets uh, when they're looking at costs and you know, IRS looks costly when you have to do it each year and the nets last three. Well, we know nets aren't currently lasting three. So I think that's sort of an unfair comparison to begin with. You need to look at you know, nets lasting two years, potentially in this setting to IRS every year. And then um, I think uh, maybe, maybe it can get, that formula gets recalculated a little bit. Um, also, we know that when using IRS, we have more options at the moment for resistance management. Uh, there, um, Matthias mentioned that we've got a new product, uh, hopefully that will be uh, PQ listed very soon. That's a new mode of action for Mitsui. Uh, we know we've been waiting on the Chlorphenopyr IRS, Solando, that's also in the PQ pipeline. If we could get those out there, we'll have a great rotation available uh, to really uh, help with resistance management. And I, I think one of the, this is going a little further off, off, off the main topic, but um, I think one of the qu big questions is if we use one of these new IRS formulations with a new ITN in the same place, um, how much more impact can we get? Um, that's an unknown question that's out there. And I think a lot of people are asking it. Uh, and, you know, it might not be one or the other. It might be in some places doing both is what you're going to need to do um, to get to zero. And we just don't have those answers yet. I'll turn it over to colleagues to add. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, Matthias, you wanted to say to add something? No, I think that actually uh, Kristen did a very good job at, uh, at explaining this. Um, I mean, you, sorry, just to just to summarize, I mean, there are two things that I, that IVCC can work on. One is uh, to, to try to, to reduce the cost of the product itself. And the second arm is to try to reduce, you know, the implementation cost. 
And so we are really trying to, to work on those two arms with an overall, overarching objective, which is not to decrease the level of efficacy of the product. So this is why, I mean, we are working with Goisper on the development of a, of a you know, device that you can put on the lens to really uh, guide uh, the operator in, in um, making an IRS application, which is as optimal as possible. And those type of uh, small addition are really helping to optimize a product, uh, a product and a process that we know is cumbersome, but uh, at the same time is uh, super effective. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Matthias. Actually, just back to that point around um, efficient spraying, you mentioned the device that would be attached to the spray cans. Um, please elaborate, el elaborate for us um, what this is all about and in terms of also checking spray quality, what IVCC is doing. Okay, so we have a, a number of activity, but here, just as an example, I'm going to um, to elaborate on the, on the collaboration that we have with um, Goisper. So Goisper, you 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 know the, the the company they have developed what is called IK Smart Light. So this is something that you are putting on at the end of the of the lens, and this is allowing you know the spray operator to have a direct feedback on, for example, you know, the distance uh, to, the, to the field. Also the, 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 the rapidity of the, of the movement of the lens. And that is really allowing to ensure that uh, through the use of this, you are putting the exact dose or close to the exact dose of, uh, of insecticide on the wall that, uh, that was planned. So this is a way to really ensure that there is uh, the, uh, the, the right level of dosage of IRS this is allowing you know an op spray operator to have the confidence that the spray program that they are implementing is actually delivering all the level of efficacy that uh, that they are expecting. So this mm. is something that is in in test at scale, and um, and the, the results that we are getting from up until now are, are really very very promising, and are really helpful for our communities. How far is it from um, being ro being rolled out? Um, I would say very quickly. <laughs> so maybe I would uh, just uh, add a little bit to what uh, Matthias just spoke about. So we know that we did the, it's been in the third year where last year in Ghana, we did a, mark, uh, a larger scale operational study to look at that. And I think one of the things that is critical about IK Smart Life that Matthias mentioned about is the fact that it's a self-training tool. Right, I come from a, with an IRS background, so I know that this is a tool that you can use in terms of training, in terms of real operations. Most standard operations you have seen in terms of training, you would have others having 10 days of training for spray operators. There are others who are doing six days of training for spray operators, but I can tell you that based Based on what we have done so far, it is possible to be able to have the number of days of training with the IK Smart Light. The other issue about it is also that the fact that it's able to write on time to tell you whether your spray quality with a kind of indication that's able to tell you how good you are spraying and that you are able to adjust anytime you make a mistake. So I see that as a self-training tool that would make IRS more user-friendly and could also impact on the core about in terms of cost. One other thing that we have learned from the agricultural industry where they have had made uh, agricultural products closer to communities. Can we build on some models within either in the Coca-Cola sector or the agricultural sector? Can we learn some lessons from there? These are things that we're exploring. Bear in mind, what are the safety issues? What are the safety issues that can be catered for? Are there pest control organizations that can assist to manage that kind of thing? So we are looking at various kinds of models to in addition to what's uh, Still, um, I spoke about the IRS more cost effective and less expensive. Phil, are you speaking? I can't hear you. 
No, thank you. Thank you for that, um, for that elaboration. I think my oh. question, my other question, and I don't, and I'm not sure if Matty has answered um, around the timelines on when this is to implementation. I don't have a, an exact date about when this is going to be made commercially available, uh, but we're right now, uh, what I know is that we are going through you know, a final round of, uh, of product optimization because we have received uh, the, some user feedback on, uh, on how to improve the system. So Goisper is, uh, is implementing this. They are doing a final round of tests. And so I'm, I'm expecting that after that, I mean, this is something that is going to be readily available. Thank you, Matthias. Fred. No, thank you. Thank you so much uh, uh, for, the, for the discussion. I think what, what you see here is that when it comes to indoor residual spraying, it's really about process, process innovation and to make it more efficient. And, and Matthias said earlier that you also don't want to lose the efficacy of the defectiveness. <laughs> you want to make sure that it is still uh, as efficacious as possible. One of the other things that has been demonstrated recently, we showed this in our last master's class as well, is, is you know, the attempt to spray half the wall, for example. There are uh, um, efforts such as this uh, that we're, we're looking at. And if there are people with any additional information on this, they, they, they can, they can uh, talk to us about those at some point. Sheila, back to you. Yeah, uh, so perhaps just to remind us, I, I know we talked about, um, we, we had about a brief description of what IVCC does. Um, I'm not sure who the right person is to take us through the different products that are in the pipeline. Um, I think perhaps just explaining this diagram in front of us uh, very, very briefly. Thank you, I can take this one. And maybe maybe one question that people ask a lot is when are we getting a new, a new insecticide class. That is and and when are we getting research. one? Yeah, exactly. Go ahead, Matthias. Thank you very much. So, so this is a, an extraction from IVCC annual report in which we are making a, a very high display of our, of our portfolio. One thing that I would like to stress is uh, what I have uh, explained at the beginning, which is that uh, you see that in our past history, we have helped bring into market a number of IRS products. Right now, we still have uh, two IRS that are, that are expected to, uh, to make it to market. One is uh, Silendo from BASF, and the other one is Vectrum T500 from, uh, from uh, uh, Mitsui Chemical Agropamine. The, the, to the question from Sheila about when are we going to have a properly new class of product, well, actually, Vectrum T500 is going to be the, you know, the first completely novel class of products that are going to make it to the, um, to the vector control market. But in addition to this, uh, um, I mean, uh, sorry, just to say that uh, with this, uh, with this work that we've done with IRS, now we are actually shifting our resources and shifting our efforts on bringing to market a new bed net, because the the first uh, really innovative bed net was Intercept G2 back in 2017. But now we need to have really a new range, a new generation of bed nets. <clears throat> going to market to offset you know, all the, the, the question related to uh, resistant, the resistance um, challenges. In order to do so, we need to have uh, new active ingredients, completely novel active ingredients with new mode of action. What you see at the bottom of the chart uh, is, uh, is a little bit of a history about how IVCC has partnered with uh, different uh, agrochemical industry in order to be able to have access to their chemical library and being able to do a complete screening of all those chemical libraries, leading up to really now a handful of compounds that are either in pre-development or in the final development phase. This means that they are really getting closer to market. That means that we have already a proof of concept that uh, they can be turned into a bed net. We have uh, the, uh, the confirmation that uh, their toxicological profile is acceptable to be developed into a proper vector control product. And that we have you know, a, a regulatory pathway that should get them up to, uh, to market uptake. So this is uh, what we are focusing on. This is what we are working on with industrial partner. Now really to register those active ingredients and to turn them into a new bed net product. 
In addition to this, uh, we are working on other type of product. What you can see is uh, uh, really at the bottom of the screen, the ATSB, so the attractive targeted sugar bait, uh, which is really focusing on how to prevent outdoor malaria transmission. That's a completely new different pro class product. And uh, this is relying also on, 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 on the class of chemistry, in this case, denotiferon, which is just making it into, uh, into vector control. Um, the, there are a few things that are actually not on this slide that, uh, that IVCC is, is working on. Um, I have mentioned already uh, the automated surveillance trap that we are working on in terms of proof concept. This is, uh, this is something that, uh, that are making uh, uh, good progress and that are delivering some interesting results. We are also working in uh, Southeast Asia on a number of programs in order to see if we can have uh, uh, products that would help uh, uh, people from being protected against malaria. One thing that we may discuss later, for example, is a forest pack that, uh, that we are testing right now in, um, in the Great Mekong, I mean, in, in uh, Cambodia in order to uh, assess you know, if this is something that is, uh, that is allowing to provide uh, the proper level of protection to, uh, to people. I think I'm going to stop here, but let me know if you have questions. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Uh, um, thanks, Matthias. Fred, would you like to chime in here? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm sure these things will keep coming back. So why don't we move forward and then we can bring them in. We, we, we're going to talk about all ATSBs, for example, uh, uh, shortly. Um, it's great because people always ask this question of, you know, how long does it take to develop a new active ingredient, 10 years, 20 years or so. And so with this outline, you kind of ask some predictions. And uh, let's move on to the next phase of this conversation. Um, uh, Charles has probably left us, but Eric is still with us. So together with Eric and our IVCC colleagues, we're going to talk a little bit about the efforts being uh, uh, used to manage insecticide resistance. Uh, you know, again, this is related to ITNs, IRS, and, and, and several other things. To begin with, I just want to ask Eric to explain broadly uh, for our audience here what these four measures uh, involve and, and why they're important and when they should be applied. Eric, if you tell that, please. Great. Um, thanks, Regos. So, uh... In the GPIRM document, uh, this I think dates back to 2012. Um, yeah, it's 2012. Yeah. Presented um, four different um, options for what countries can do um, to ensure that vector control remains effective. And so one of those was rotations. So rotations was basically meaning that um, countries could switch between insecticides uh, that have different modes of modes of action at different times. Um, at different intervals. So for example, this is mostly applicable to IRS. So um, conducting IRS with um, a, one class of insects. So for example, pyrethroids in one year and then a different class in the next year. So uh, for example, the next year they could use open phosphates. And then mosaics. Mosaics was a deployment of multiple active ingredients in uh, different geographical areas within the same country. So for example, if there are, there are places within the country that had high levels of resistance, they could deploy, um, so high levels of pyrethroid resistance, they could deploy non pyrethroids in those areas. For example, using, um, say, uh, organophosphate, um, um IRS formulation in an area with high levels of pyrethroid resistance and using pyrethroid-based IRS formulations in an area that um, um, had um, no or very low levels of resistance. So therefore being able to use uh, more than one type of insecticide within the same country. Mixtures was the use of, of formulations that combine more than one, um, one uh, insecticide formulation. So for example, the previous slides, uh, we did see the types, um, we did see insecticides like fedora fusion, which, which combined the methane and clomethylidine, so two different classes of insecticides being put together so that you're, you're able to impact them with the quick action of the pyrethroid insecticide, but also with the, with, with the um, resistance mitigation of the organophosphate. And then combinations was where we could use multiple tools, for example, uh, for example giving out LLINs and in the same area also um, doing IRS, which is very common in many parts of Africa. 
So um, in in the households that receive IRS, they still have an alliance so that um, they remain protected as they sleep, even when um, the IRS formulation wears off. Uh, thanks a lot, Eric, for the overview. Uh, this kind of overview is really, really important for for, uh, 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 for our audience just, just to start up the conversations, and, and, and we appreciate that. Um, the, the global plan for insecticide resistance management also had what they refer to as short term, medium term, and long term. But since it is a 2012 uh, formulation, uh, I think we're just going to wait until we have the next one, or maybe we already have another one. Uh, instead of talking about the timeline, so we'll skip that. A quick question to you, Eric, is whether you, whether this is something that is important to explain, whether you can explain it to us, uh, or if Charles is still there, if we can explain it. This idea that resistance can go unnoticed for a long time and then all of a sudden you have it everywhere. This tipping point uh, question. You're yes, muted, so, um, the, the thing is, um, especially when uh, countries only rely on uh, phenotypic resistance monitoring. So that is the use of uh, the resistance kits. Um, what happens is that by the time you notice that the population is, is, has, um, is, is already getting to the levels of resistance that you can, you can see in bioassays, most often there's already um, developed genetic um, um, genetic uh, mechanisms of resistance. So that is why, um, for example, genetic monitoring of resistance is very important. Usually what happens is that by the time you see something happening, in, um, something is, that is physi physiologically demonstrated, for example, uh, mosquitoes that, that become tolerant to, to insecticides, it means that for, for a while they've actually been developing those mechanisms. And so usually there's an argument that by then it might be too late to do anything about the resistance um, that you see in the populations. And so if you're able to detect resistance much earlier on, you're able to do much more about it than you can do when it, it gets to the point where the tipping point, as, as, you, as you show in this slide. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Perhaps um, is there a relationship? And I think you alluded to this, but perhaps now thinking about the NMCPs where they have limited resources in terms of conducting molecular assays, or biochemical assays for resistance mechanisms, detecting the, the genes. What is the relationship between um, frequency um, and the status or the physiological um, aspects that are detected by the tube or the CDC bottle bioassays? Is there a relationship at all? Good question. Uh, so the, 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 the thing is, to this point, there are very few um, markers of resistance, genetic markers of resistance that can be directly correlated with, uh, with insecticide resistance. So one, one marker that was very good was the, the West African KDR mutation, L1014F. Um, so that was a very good marker of resistance in that in most cases, it did actually um, correlate very well with the uh, phenotypic resistance. The 1014S um, mutation, which is the East African KDR mutation, didn't do as well. But that is currently a focus of many of uh, many of the people working in this space. I know Charles Wong's lab is very um, is, is doing a lot of work in this area. Our lab is doing a lot of work in this area, trying to identify new markers of resistance. And as we try to develop these new markers, what we're trying to aim at is markers that can be directly correlated with insecticide resistance. So. Um, uh, the thing is, there, there are a few markers that, that, that have really good correlation so far, uh, but this is an area that still requires a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So work in progress. Work in progress, yes. Thank you, Eric. Fred, anything to add? No, ex excellent, excellent point. I think, I think that, that gives us a fairly good introduction to, to engage with our IVTC colleagues here. Uh, uh, Matthias, uh, Christian, Andrew, here is work from my colleague Nancy. Nancy Stephen Mato worked a lot with us at Ifakara and continues to work with us, but is currently working um, at the London School together with Natasha. Uh, she uh, published this work here, and, and this is corroborated by many, many people in West Africa and East Africa as well. Very well known observation that uh, agriculturalists or agriculture people, or crop protection people, use exactly the same 
uh, uh, active ingredient. But also when you go to the villages or communities where malaria is endemic and people are using these chemicals, the, the actual disposal pattern is not uh, as good as we would wish that it, that it were. So you, you have pictures uh, uh, such, as, just, such as this. Now, when you guys have conversations with industry, do these questions come up in terms of uh, what responsibility should IVCC or industry take in ensuring that insecticide resistance management practices by public health people actually includes uh, the agricultural sector? So broadly speaking, what can you say about this? Thank you, Fadras, for this question. I mean, this is a, this is a great question. And uh, I can tell you that this is something that uh, that is very much on top of the agenda of the discussion that we are having with uh, with industry representative. I think that uh, later on you have um, uh, a snippet on uh, on, a, on a program called uh, Zero by 40, which is uh, which is a convening of, um, of some of the key industrial partners that, uh, that IVCC is working with. And one of the latest work that has been done under under this uh, hospice is uh, the publication of um, a document outlining how IRM should be implemented and what role can be played by um, by the industry. So this is something that is published on uh, on IVCC website and on the Zero Way Forty website, and so you can you can have a look at it. But this is uh, this is something just to uh, to really highlight that uh, that every single um, organization who are involved into vector control treatment from the manufacturer to those who are going to implement it have a, have really a, a role to play in, in, into this and so that there is really a, a lot of thinking and uh, and um, operationalizing that needs to be done in order to implement all the recommendation that uh, that you have just presented from GPERM. how do we do the rotation how do we do the, mo the mosaic how do we create new products that are including mixture of active ingredients and so on and so forth? So just, just to say that this is something that is, uh, that is very high on the agenda. The other point that I would like to, to mention is that you are making this link between um, insecticides that are being used in agriculture and insecticides that are being used for vector control. And obviously, you know, the additional risk that this is uh, creating to see resistance emerging for vector control because uh, mosquitoes are already exposed to, uh, to products that are being used in agriculture. This is exactly why IVCC with its partner are working on the development of novel active ingredients. Those novel active ingredients are not expected uh, to be used in agriculture. They are going to be really dedicated uh, to public health, public health use. And so this is uh, with the expectation that this is going to minimize uh, the risk of resistance buildup because it's going to be only used in public health. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I think that that if we had a product that is purely public health, I think that would be that would be super. Uh, when you so, discuss with the industry, is it possible? Is it? I mean, industry produces a single product at a time, but you are talking combinations here. How easy is it to convince? industry to say, okay, don't release this until we have the other product so that we have combination uh, therapy, for example, or is, is this something that, that is ever discussed? Yes, so, so there are a couple of ways to approach this as you can imagine. First, I mean, the, all, all the, I mean, most of the companies have access to a portfolio of, uh, of insecticide product on their own that they are working you know, to try to see if they can combine them to, to make a mixture product. But that's also another uh, other aspect of the zero by forty platform is that we are really trying to have a, you know a, a strategic alignment between between company to say that because we are talking about public health we need to do you know some some additional level of collaboration that uh, that are over and beyond you know what uh, what what uh, organization um, private organization are usually doing. And to really try to facilitate the exchange of technology between companies and to, to actually combine them into public health product. So this is uh, something, I mean, this period has been signed into uh, on the zero by 40 declaration, but obviously this is something that is, uh, that is taking uh, some time to, to get into the, into the process. Excellent. I noticed that, uh, thank you so much, Matthias. I noticed Andrew has something to add. Andrew, are you there? Yes, so I just wanted to add to what Matthias said in terms of the 
agree again better control. So in most of the countries, they are beginning to have a platform where they are inviting the agricultural sector onto their better control technical working groups so that they can share experiences and what kind of monitoring is ongoing with various uh, in different sector. Having said that, I think in terms of waste management, I think I'm aware that depending on what product is used, the PMI in particular project, that's what we call the recycling. So they have a recycling, uh, recycling of the waste where, for example, when it was a telic, they're able to recycle the plastic into pavement blocks or chairs and what have you. So that's one way that I know on the field how the waste management is being handled. Excellent, excellent. Thank you guys so, so, so much. I think it's time for us now to talk a little bit about outdoor control with ICC, ATSPs, et cetera, et cetera. Very exciting topic to begin. Oh no, before that, Shayla. <laughs> we have a very important question here from Shayla. Yeah, talking about um, other tools other than the classical ones. Um, so, Perhaps just a bit of a background. This is a study um, where the eve tubes, insecticide treated eve tubes, uh, were compared to a control intervention. So, um, an intervention arm had the eve tubes, insecticide treated eve tubes, uh, plus house improvements. So, screening of the eaves, um, screening of the windows, generally house improvement. And then the control arm just had um, bed nets. And, and from this study, the addition of the eve tubes and house screening reduced malaria incidences in the children by 38%. So I wonder if this is something that IVCC is thinking about or perhaps just your thoughts around this specific intervention. Yes, I'll start here. Um... Yeah, I mean, currently, um, I, Eve tubes are not in our portfolio as other groups are working on them. But we 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 not only you know focus on what we we currently have in our portfolio. We do keep our eyes and ears out, and we have sort of a watch list of um, other interventions that are, that are out there. And obviously, Eve tubes um, showing this great result out of Cote d'Ivoire is definitely on sort of our watch list. Uh, we know that. Um, there's a second trial that's hopefully uh, underway with them. And if, if there's two trials, then, then that the intervention can um, be evaluated by VCAG. And I think if this, um, this intervention, which looks fairly promising, um, can move forward, there's always the potential that um, we could get involved down the road in terms of thinking about the insecticides that um, uh, formulations to be placed on the eve tubes. Something that's really great uh, for, from my perspective with the eve tubes is that they, they do allow for really um, various insecticides to be placed. You can put multiple insecticides in the house at once, so you can have that combination of insecticides, uh, that mosaic, uh, as well as a nice rotation of insecticides. And because of the way um, they're formulated and they're, they're not next to people, you might also have different options for the types of insecticides you can put on them. So I think there's a really great opportunity, particularly for resistance management um, using, using this uh, tool. And uh, one thing that I, I think is worth pointing out here too, is that the, these um, worked in a setting uh, where there's significant pyrethroid resistance and the insecticide that was put on the, the eve tubes in the electrostatic form was a pyrethroid. And so the mosquitoes died basically because um, that the electrostatic insecticide jumps onto their bodies and they just receive a very, very high dose. So this might also enable us to you know, play around with formulations a bit, use uh, potentially different insecticides. I think it uh, could be a, a great platform, but uh, currently we, uh, as others are developing it, it's not a main focus, but it is on our radar. And I, I personally um, am very excited about the possibility of this tool. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. So the other the other component of this specific one was house improvement. Hello, go what ahead. Have IVCC go ahead. Thought, yeah, what have IVCC thoughts on house improvement generally? 
And that's a little more out of our particular wheelhouse as it's not really an, an intervention to, to develop. Um, but obviously, as um, housing improves, we're going to see, you know, uh, greater improvements in malaria control overall. And I think we're all, you know, supportive of um, housing improvement in general and any, you know, economic development leading to housing improvement. But it's not necessarily uh, an intervention as such um, that we would particularly focus on versus the Eve tube component where there would be um, you know, some kind of formulation need that, from our perspective, we, we would work on potentially as a product down the road. So I completely second what uh, what Kristen has just said. I mean, I think that this is, uh, you know, the, the line of thinking within IVCC. But one thing that I would like to, to stress is that uh, we believe that in order to achieve malaria eradication, we need to, to layer all the intervention that we can. And when I'm talking about all the intervention, I'm talking about vector control, I'm talking about house improvement, I'm talking about uh, medicines, I'm talking about vaccines. And all these, we need to put this in motion in order to be able to, to really get to malaria eradication. And for this, I mean, this is really going to require, you know, us to be, to be really as smart as we can in order to, to optimize the way we are overlaying those, some of those different interventions and making sure that, uh, that we can give a maximum level of protection to people living in the pandemic country. Over. Thank you. Um, back to you, Fred. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, so sorry, I, I, I took leave a little bit. My son just fell down. So sorry, sorry to get the uh, connection back. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, no problem. Um, we have here uh, a study by April uh, and colleagues from Zanzibar. Uh, illustrating really the importance of uh, outdoor biting risk uh, and also the risk that happens before bedtime. We have uh, in recent years, a few weeks ago, we have a study from Central African Republic that also shows that in addition to the outdoor biting, we actually also have a significant level of data. In this case, we talk about 20 to 30 percent of malaria infection, so malaria, malaria mosquito bites actually happening uh, during the, the, the day. And they show here that a lot of those mosquitoes actually carry plasmodium. So this is something that entomologists do not usually in, uh, uh, investigate. But I think with this study, it's, it's, we're going to see a lot more investigation on this, uh, the annual uh, biting patterns. Uh, and it complicates the outdoor biting problem that we already have. This is already illustrated by, by uh, uh, Ellie Sherrod Smith from Imperial College, together with colleagues that demonstrated about 10 million new malaria cases and accounted for or associated with this out, outdoor biting. And I think, therefore, it's a very important thing for us, and we are encouraged by the fact that IBCC and partners are looking at what to do in the outdoor space. I believe now that you will also be looking at what to do in the daytime space. In, in the days ahead. And we would like to have a conversation a little bit about some of these tools. There are multiple tools that we know IBCC has worked on. We have mosquito traps here. This is where Professor William Tarkin, a fantastic friend of ours, done a great, his team has done a great study in Western Kenya and uh, demonstrating the, uh, in RCT the power of mosquito traps. We have uh, ivermectin demonstrated very well in West Africa and a big study, a Bohemia study, uh, led by my friend Carlos Shakur. Uh, in Mozambique and Kenya, and partly in Tanzania, uh, going on at the moment. This is from Senegal, though. Um, and then we have ATSB, uh, a, a great progress made for a very long time by colleagues in Mali. And then at some stage, IVCC comes in and says, let's scale this up. So at this point, we'd like to invite our IVCC colleagues Talk to us a little bit about the story of, IV, of ATSBs from IVCC perspective. When did it start? What is happening? Uh, uh, what should we, we see uh, going forward? But let's start here. The story of, of attractive toxic sugar, targeted sugar bits. It used to be called attractive toxic sugar bits. Attractive targeted sugar bits now. What is the story from the IVCC side? Back to you. Thank you, Fred Rose. So the story started actually uh, quite a long time ago, in 2014 and 15. IVCC has uh, uh, launched a call for proposal to find a new project to target outdoor transmission. And we did this because, uh, because we knew that, uh, that it was for us, you know, the, the kind of the next frontier, you know, <laughs> that was the next 
generation of products that was required in order to be able to really tackle malaria transmission. And we knew all the, the challenges, and we, we, know that it, we knew that it was difficult to do this. Therefore, we have made this call for proposal. We have selected out of this call for proposal three projects, and one of them was ATSB that was proposed by this Israeli company called West Ham. It started with a proof of concept done in Mali in 2016 and 2017. It was an interesting proof of concept because it was a proof of concept at scale, meaning that it was done in 14 villages in Mali. And the result of this proof of concept was outstanding. We have demonstrated really a number of key elements to, to demonstrate that it could work. The first element was that uh, uh, it was possible to display a bait station for six months, which was about you know, the duration of uh, the transmission season in, in Mali setting. And while this, this uh, bait station was uh, deployed, it was allowing to reduce the overall mosquito population very significantly and therefore reducing the biting level. We, we have, you know, measure the, um, the EIR um, drop uh, throughout, uh, throughout the season, and it was essentially getting down to, uh, to almost zero. So that was a, a fantastic proof of concept, and which has uh, raised a lot of uh, expectation related to this. Therefore, starting in 2018, we have uh, uh, started a product optimization um, program. And this, because all the, uh, the big stations that were in Mali were essentially you know, handmade. And so we, 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 we couldn't do any kind of scale up uh, with, uh, with this system. So West Ham has done an enormous amount of work in order to, to uh, allow the, the, the scalability of, uh, of the big station. You see on this slide, you know, a few illustration about uh, the, the various version of the big station, but all the work that had been put into this was to allow really uh, production at scale of, of this big station while ensuring level of efficacy and ensuring um, durability in, uh, in, in, um, in field condition. That was done in collaboration with uh, a number of organizations located into three countries. We have continued the work in Mali, we have extended it uh, to uh, Kenya and in, uh, in Zambia as well. All this work uh, had uh, continued through 2019, 2020, and 2021, in which we have uh, ensured that we have the, the right level of uh, entomological impact and that we were able to measure the level of uh, feeding rate for those bait stations. Based on those results, uh, we have uh, green lighted at the end of 2021 the launch of uh, three. Uh, control randomized control trial in um, uh, in Kenya, Zambia, and Mali, and those trials are now ongoing. So I'm very happy to report that uh, that it started in November 2021 in Zambia. It started uh, in April in uh, uh, Kenya, and uh, the bait station were are just uh, finalized to be deployed in Mali this month. Those are our city trial are expected to last two years. And so by the end of those two years, we will be able to make a case uh, to uh, VCAG uh, to, uh, for demonstration of uh, public health value of ATSB, hoping that we are going to have uh, a positive outcome. And if this is the case, uh, then it will follow a specific pathway with an expectation of a PQ listing by 2025, if we are successful. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, surprisingly, uh, I mean, this is kind of catching people by surprise, but I remember for many years, uh, our friend Woody Foster worked on, on, on sugar feeding uh, almost alone, you know, like nobody is interested in this. And the people working with ATSB, uh, Dr. Muller's team worked a long time for this uh, without a lot of interest. And, and then they demonstrate this. They, they show these results that demonstrate uh, very high levels of impact, especially on old mosquitoes, uh, which is great. And I have to say, though, that I participated, not that I always get these opportunities to participate in stuff like that, but I, I was at a meeting where uh, in one of the uh, Gates, from the Gates, Mr. Gates' office, uh, deep dive events, 
And he said something to us like, you know, he understands why genomics took time, but he does not understand why ATSVs took time. He does not understand why this intervention was not there much earlier than, than it is, because a very simple thing and yet so, so impactful. Talk to us a little bit about the advantages of ATSVs as a vector control tool and over other things. Thanks. So there are, there are def definitely a number of advantages of, uh, of ATSB. First, I mean, this is uh, really <laughs> targeting outdoor transmission. Uh, this is something that you are placing on the outside of the home and so exposing, you know, um, mosquito population that are outdoor day in, day out. And, and so that, that's really addressing a strategic gap that we have into our portfolio. And we are expecting that this is going to materialize into uh, into significant uh, uh, improvement of um, the fight against malaria. What uh, got us excited about uh, about ATSB is that uh, we are expecting that this is going to be also an affordable uh, intervention. Uh, we are still working on it, and we are doing you know the the scaling up of the of the manufacturing. But when you are looking at the basic setup, about how this is engineered, you know the the, the bait station, the membrane the bait matrix and the active ingredient that you are putting inside. In the end, I mean, that should be really, um, you know, an affordable intervention, affordable from a product price standpoint, but also from a deployment standpoint. Uh, we, we believe that, uh, that it is something that, uh, that could be deployed um, more, I mean, more easily compared to, uh, to typically to an IRS campaign. So all this is going to really help uh, to, to, to bring it uh, really to scale. The thing that was also surprising and a good surprise with, uh, with the ATSB is that it has a broad spectrum of efficacy. When we are testing it in West Africa and when we are testing it in East Africa with a different mosquito population, a different mix of, of gen genera, where, where we see is that uh, there, there is still a good, very good level of efficacy of ATSB, that they are all feeding on, on, on an ATSB. And that's really opening up you know, quite a lot of uh, perspective in terms of uh, the, really the range of deployment that we can, that we can envisage. Right now, this first, ver first version of ATSB is based on uh, Dinotefran, but the, the, the principle itself should allow you know, for the introduction of other insecticides within, uh, within this bait matrix. We can really broaden the scope and therefore you know, this is really increasing the, 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 <laughs> the, our ability to develop new sets of, new sets of product that will facilitate uh, uh, the insecticide resistance management strategy. And finally, uh, this is something that is, uh, that is not uh, uh, intrusive. So we believe that it is going to be something quite easy to deploy alongside other intervention. The RCT trial that we are performing right now are done above uh, standard of care. That means that this is over and beyond the use of uh, bed nets into, into the different villages in which this is going to be tested. So that, I mean, for all those reasons, we believe that uh, you know, ATSB, if we are demonstrating that this is generating the level of efficacy that we are expecting for, could become really a game changer. Yeah, perhaps Fred, uh, we can hear from Eric. Um, Eric, are you still there with us? I am, yes. Yeah, yeah, perhaps just a comparison between ATSBs and the other new tools. I know you've been working on several other tools. So perhaps just a comparison. Um, great. Um, so, so in terms of, so the, the thinking about um, ATSBs and the space that it comes in, I think that's a pretty unique um, opportunity given that this is mostly targeting outdoor biting. Um, though evidence from, from, from experiments we've done before shows that it might actually be able to target both indoor and um, outdoor resting mosquitoes. Uh, the, the other tools that we have been evaluating so far have mostly been um, targeted indoors. So for example, uh, in our site um, out in Busia, we're currently evaluating spatial repellents, indoor, indoor um, placed spatial repellent devices. Uh, and this is an indoor tool, so of course not, not comparable in that regard. Um, and then of course the other the evaluations we've done, we've done have been for um, 
different uh, formulations of bed nets, different um, formulations of insecticides for IRS. And uh, uh, the, the unique thing about this is, is that they're targeting um, this, this um, niche that the other tools haven't been able to target so far, which is the outdoor biting um, mosquitoes. And, and, and this is going to be very important, especially as, as you think about residual transmission and, and as we think about um, transmission that will happen beyond the, the scope of uh, the house. Thank you, thank you, Eric. And we are just three three years away, right, Matthias? Yeah, in terms of PQ listing, we are we are expecting that um, yes, it, it's going to take until 2025, you know, to to get it listed. I mean, we, if uh, the, the sequence of activity is respected. If I if I can just add because uh, because I see that there are quite a lot of uh, question in the chat related to you know how durable is uh, is the, the bait station and what is happening when this is rained upon and so on. This is part of uh, all the testing that uh, that we are doing, you know, to to ensure that uh, the, the ATSB is. Uh, is durable when it is exposed to rain, when it is exposed to a sun, when it is exposed to wind and dust and so on and so forth. And what we see uh, up until now is that it is possible. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not a done deal. I mean, we, we can still, you know, optimize the, uh, the the product to make it more resilient to all those different uh, elements. But right now, when with uh, with the type of deployment that we are what, that we are advocating for, which is uh, you know to put to put this on the out wall. 1.8 meter high below the eaves. This is uh, this is a position in which we can we can have you know the HSB remaining effective for six months. Yeah, thanks, Matthias. Uh, there's another interesting question on uh, on your thoughts around how it would be deployed at the last. So, sorry, say that again. What what is the question? Your thoughts around um, deployments on a large scale. Okay, so for for the time being, I mean, we are we are expecting that uh, the the first step of deployment is going to be pretty close to to an IRS campaign, meaning with um, with people who are going to be dedicated and how, who are going to go, you know, into community and are going to make uh, you know a full deployment within this community of ATSB. But there are quite a lot of other options that uh, that we should look at, you know, using uh, either private sector or really, you know, just. Uh, local communities and that, that would uh, roll out themselves ATSB. Because as you have seen, you know, into the picture, this is this is a principle which is which is very I mean which is very simple. You take the bait station, four nails, so you put it on the on the wall, and that is it. So that's that's something that, uh, that you could really imagine uh, would have you know alternative type of deployment. Right now, we are still at the beginning. We are doing it into a very controlled environment. But what we are expecting is that in the coming um, in the coming year, we are going to really open up with uh, with our different partners and see if there could be you know easier, easy, more I mean, easier way to actually do this deployment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So there are questions in the chat around um, um, the environment. So around uh, the, the competition between the ATSBs and the flowering plants and how this would be, how this would bias, for example, their deployment in forested areas. Um, what's your comment on that, Matthew? So I think, Sheila, the, the best, just, just before Matthias goes on, it might be necessary to provide some context to that specific one, actually. I see it in the chat a lot mm -hmm. as well. And uh, we, we have here, Matthias, uh, an interesting uh, study from uh, um, from West Africa. This is a study done by uh, friends of ours, including Mamadou Koulibaly, uh, colleague of ours. Uh, not related to ATSBs at all, but it's really just an assessment of nectar densities in different ecosystems. Uh, uh, Halfan, can you guys mute uh, that guy? Uh, not related, this study, specific study is not related to ATSBs but uh, uh, it's done in Mali, and a lot of the previous ATSB work was done in Mali as well. But Mali is an interesting country in the sense that you have these very dry areas, you also have the deep forest. <laughs> so it kind of offers a chance uh, to assess what does malaria transmission look like in these settings. You see two interesting things here. One is very high blood feeding, human blood feeding rates across those ecotypes. Uh, and you also have malaria infection rates in mosquitoes, kind of similar across this. 
uh, be it uh, the, the deep forest area or the arid savanna, you see that mosquito blood feeding to humans is, is kind of that. It is a common question. People say, hey, ATSBs are depending on sugar. So it will work if there are no alternative plants, such as it's been put in the chart here. What if you go to a country where there's a lot of plants, flowers? So I guess this is the question that, that, that Ashella picked up from, uh, from the chart. And um, at, at Ifakara, a colleague of ours at Ifakara, a, a young student there is just gone to our semi-field screen house systems and created different ecosystems in each chamber, dry plant life, little a few plants, a lot of plants, and this testing ATSBs in there to see what will happen. We're waiting for that data. But broadly speaking, talk to us about this, how this has influenced your strategy for evaluating ATSBs. Eric is here, he's from the tropics, if I may say. <laughs> we have studies from Mali. So together you guys can talk to us a little bit about how this question, which is common, very important, how this question is influencing ATSB strategies. Thank you very much for the uh, seminar. Shell, I'll, sorry I'll, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the long introduction. No this. problem, no problem. So if you don't mind, I, I will start and then I will let Eric uh, comment because I think that he can really give, um, give you insight on, on what he has seen in, in Kenya. But as you can expect, I mean, this is something that has uh, keep uh, us busy um, ever since, you know, the beginning of, uh, of, the, um, of this ATSB work. Uh, how would ATSB work if it is put into a very competitive environment with uh, natural sugar sources, alternative natural sugar sources? And that's something that uh, have been checked and monitored ever since the beginning. We have put ATSB into a different type of environment, going from you know extremely uh, harried environment in which there, were, there was almost no competition to environment in which there would be a very significant level of competition and anything in between. The result up to now is that uh, actually, you know, in, in all those different uh, uh, types of setting, ATSB still work, meaning that a mosquito are still feeding on, on ATSB. When we are recapturing uh, mosquitoes and we are able, you know, to make the distinction between those who have fed on ATSB and those who have fed on other sugar sources and that we see that even in those very competitive environments, there is still enough mosquitoes feeding on ATSB that should lead to a significant entomological impact. We've done a, a number of uh, studies in collaboration with, uh, with the Oxford University in order to do you know, mapping, botanical mapping on the environment uh, in order to, to see how we can uh, um, evaluate uh, the amount of uh, alternative uh, sugar sources into, into different environment. And so this work uh, is, um, is uh, helpful in order to, to try to establish you know, guiding principle in terms of where ITSB would, would best work. But what I would like to, to finish with is to say that um, with these uh, uh, RCT trials that we have ongoing into those three countries, Mali, Kenya, and Zambia, we are going to have you know, a pretty diverse representation. So not only in terms of uh, mosquito species uh, available into this environment, but also what are going to be the, the level of uh, uh, different sugar, natural sugar sources available. And finally, you know, a third parameter, which is the different uh, um, setup in terms of uh, housing, density of housing, uh, you know, and, and uh, how we can best deploy ATSB. So we are expecting that um, one of the outcome of this uh, of those trial is to give us a lot more indication in terms of what type of recommendation we can give to best deploy ATSB. Eric, great. Um, so yes, so um, this this has actually been a a big question for us. Even going in, we were worried that Mali is slightly different from uh, most of our countries. So for example, like. Um, Kenya and uh, and Zambia, where the studies are currently being done, uh, pretty um, um, uh, dense. There's like there's, there's an abundance of uh, sugar sources for mosquitoes, and so we worried about. Yeah, the, Eric, the, the picture on the left is actually from one of your study sites. This is from yes. a, it's a village from Kisi. Yeah, we really uh, the other one is a village from Mali. Yeah. So the level of competition in terms of sugar availability for mosquitoes in an area like uh, in, in these two areas. It's pretty significant. And so we worried about the competition for ATSBs. 
And so in the last two years, we've conducted um, an ASB trial. So ASBs were exactly like HSBs, but without the toxin. And what was added to the, to the formulation was um, a uranium dye. So it's, it's a fluorescent dye. And we put out HSBs in, sorry, the ASB station in uh, 10 villages. And uh, we captured mosquitoes every month for about, um, for between, um, for actually about seven months total. And what we realized was that we were still able to achieve about 4% um, uh, feeding rates in Kenya and uh, a, a lot higher, about 20% daily feeding rates in, in Zambia. And of course, much, much higher feeding rates in, in, in Mali as, as would be expected. So what we do know for sure is that there would be starkly different um, rates of feeding on HSBs in the different environments. But then one thing we're confident about is that we are still able to achieve a level of feeding that would be sufficient to be able to have a significant impact on malaria incidence. That said, we've also done some attractancy evaluation. So we have a botanist on our team who's been working on trying to figure out how HSBs compete with uh, different flowering plants. And so he, put, he, uh, he brought in um, a couple of, um, actually 16 different flowering plants into our semi-field system and evaluated them in terms of attractants just so that he could rank them uh, from one to 16 uh, based on the attractancy. So from that experiment, he found out that uh, the mango plant was actually the most attractive. And he then went on to, to do additional comparisons now between the mango and different versions of HSB. And from those experiments, HSVs have consistently been more attractive to mosquitoes than any of the plants that we've evaluated so far. So because of that, we are, we are pretty confident that HSVs are sufficiently attractive that in the environment, they can actually attract mosquitoes, even when you have other sources of sugar. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Eric, while you are at it, can you explain a little bit uh, using this example of Mat Matthias? talked about the, the RCTs in the three different countries. So using the Kenyan example, uh, the, uh, can you talk a little bit about how this, this, this is designed, how it's going, um, the expectations? Yes, great. So um, um, speaking specifically about Kenya, so we, we're conducting this, the trial in, in Siaya County, which is the, the, the county in the map. And uh, that has, so the two areas that are designated, two sub-counties that are currently being involved in this work. Uh, one is a Lego Songa to the north, and to the south, we have Rareda uh, sub-counties. And so um, 35 randomly um, selected clusters have been given ATSB, so they're allocated to the ATSB arm. And another 35 clusters are not given any ATSBs. Um, in total, about 80,000 big stations have been distributed. And this will be replaced every six months. And so um, just in line with, with the ATSB distribution, we also plan to have um, cohorts of, of children um, recruited every six months. So the children are between ages of one to 14. And once they're recruited, um, every, every month they are assessed for malaria infection. And based on this, we're able to estimate incidents uh, in, in the clusters. And so during this over a period of two years, we'll be able to know what level of incidences we're able to see in the ATSB clusters versus the non-ATSB clusters. Additionally, Eric, we are, yep. Eric uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, so is this in addition to bed nets or IRS? Yes. So this is in addition to bed nets. There's no IRS in this. In this right. uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go and, ahead. Uh, I'm sorry to mention that. So this, this actually, the ATSB distribution started uh, this year, and, and um, this is following um, an LLIN distribution that happened uh, mid to late last year. So the, the, most of these households have nets, and the nets are pretty new and in good shape. So all of this intervention is going to be the ATSP plus bed nets or bed nets alone. And then in addition to the, to the cohort study, we also have entomological monitoring where we're using human learning catches conducted every month. And the, the, the idea behind human learning catches is that we want to be able to capture as many as possible live mosquitoes. Because uh, from the study conducted in Mali earlier on, the study that um, um, Fred was showed earlier on from Mali, um, there was demonstration that HSB that have a significant impact on the longevity of mosquitoes. And therefore we are likely to see an even greater impact on, um, on, on the parity rates. Uh, of mosquitoes compared to their densities. And so this trial is powered to look at the impact on, uh, um, on, on the majority of mosquitoes 
And so um, we collect mosquitoes uh, using entomological, using human learning patterns and dissect them so that we're able to determine whether they're parasites or not. And so over the next two years, we, able, we will be able to determine whether it is bees have an impact, of course, on malaria incidence, but also if it is bees have an impact on uh, the longevity of mosquitoes and density of mosquitoes. If, if I may, because I see that there are quite a lot of questions uh, in the chat related to, um, to human and uh, environmental um, uh, risk. So one thing that I would like to share with everybody is that uh, this product has gone through a significant uh, human and environmental risk assessment, something that actually have been shared with uh, the WHO PQ team and reviewed by, uh, by their own expert. And so this is uh, assessed as a, as a, as a low risk uh, product. Uh, of course, I mean, we, we still need to take a number of precaution related to it. Uh, the biggest question that is popping all the time is related to pollinators because, I mean, this is a sugar-based um, product. So far, you know, the, the, uh, all the experiments that we, that we are doing are, are tending to demonstrate that, uh, that pollinators, and in this case, especially bees, have a very low level of interest for, uh, for ATSB. To test this, I mean, we've put, uh, you know, bait station with uh, cameras in front that are taking uh, shots, you know, on a, on a very frequent basis. We've looked out, uh, you know, thousands of, uh, of those pictures with beehive, uh, you know, next to it. And we see that uh, the bees are, are, are not actually visiting the bait station. For those who do not know the product, uh, be, be aware that there is a membrane on top of it and, uh, and that this is uh, really the mechanism that is uh, helping with the protection of the bait, that is making it durable, making it last through time, but also are not, uh, you know, um, help, I mean, are not allowing, you know, insects such as bees to feed on the bait. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shela Bakhti. Yeah, so I think um, the question I had, Fred, was around the non-target insects. Um... All right. Okay, so I, I think that I have just uh, addressed you, you kind it. of answered yeah. that, yeah, Matthias. Yeah. Kind yeah. of answered that, yeah. <laughs> Do you have any additional yes. comments on any challenges faced by HSP? Matthias? Yes, yeah. Matthias. Or, or the type of challenges with HSP? Yeah. Well, the thing that I would like to maybe to raise is that one of the challenge uh, or one of the question with, uh, with ATSB being a completely new intervention, this is uh, the level of acceptance. Uh, you know, when, when we have uh, started the development of this product, we thought, yeah, that, you know, putting those bait station on the out, outside of the wall of the houses would be very, very easy, you know, to, to gain, uh, you know, uh, people acceptance within, within the community. What we've learned through time and through the experiment is that it's not a done deal. It still requires you know, quite a lot of communication to people living in the, in the villages and in their houses about what this intervention is about, what is the composition of the bait, because when people are opening the bait, they are seeing you know, this brownish liquid. And so people are saying, this is blood. And so there is no blood into it. I mean, this is just a sugar solution. But you can imagine that, you know, when people were thinking, oh, you are putting something based on blood, you know, in, 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 on my house, that was not going down too well. So like, uh, like for any new intervention, there is a need to, to communicate, to engage with, uh, with the community, to make sure that there is a proper dialogue to explain uh, really the, the nature of the product, uh, how this is going to be deployed, what is going to be the expected impact, uh, and what is going to happen with, uh, with the product once the deployment is over. So that was one really one of the big learning of this uh, of this experience. Thank you guys so 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 much for that, and it's 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 nice that uh, you know we have the explanations from the IVC side, but also from Eric. So we do hope that we will still have another masterclass on ATSPs in future, together with other new tools, and hopefully we will bring in our colleagues from Mali as well. Uh, otherwise, this is this has been fantastic. Uh, we're going to move forward now to the last, last bit. Uh, we have some other questions that we will have to skip because of time. But the very last bit that we would like to tackle with you guys is this one. So here we, <coughs> we see a, a, a broad representation of mosquitoes in different parts of the world. We know that IBCC has a lot of work in the Indo-Pacific region as well. And uh, I know that uh, Fred 
Fred Yeomans from IVCC is here. He works a lot in this area. Uh, it would be nice, Fred, if you could spend some few minutes uh, to discuss with us broadly what IVCC does in the Indo-Pacific region, how that is going, why this is important, um, uh, especially the interactions between the Anopheles work and the Aegis work, and, and what lessons we could tap into uh, for the other for the other parts of the world. So uh, very briefly on that, uh, uh, take it on, please. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Fred Joss, and um, feel free to uh, interrupt me with any any questions at any time or, or shorten what I'm saying if I'm going on too long. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, as, as everybody knows, at IVCC, our main focus is on sub-Saharan Africa, but since 2018, we've been working uh, in the Indo-Pacific region more than we, we did before. Um, that's because we secured a grant from the Australian government from uh, DFAT, which is their... Uh, Department for Foreign Affairs and, and Trade. So that's really allowed us to try and look at some of the experience that we have um, from our partnerships in Africa around vector control, innovation and market access, and try to apply them to um, settings within the Indo-Pacific region. So um, we, we're running two um, main projects under that, uh, that initial grant. So we call the program IPI, Indo-Pacific Initiative, um, we're working with partners uh, in the region to, to run a project called Project Bite, um, which is evaluating bite prevention tools uh, in the, the greater Mekong subregion within a, a, a malaria elimination scenario. And we're also working with partners in Papua New Guinea to evaluate a range of, of novel vector control tools. And what we see in PNG, it's, it, it, it's not an elimination scenario there. Uh, malaria cases are actually rising. So it's more similar to, to some of the, the situations and settings that we're familiar with um, in, in Africa. And the tools that we're looking at in PNG are um, IRS uh, larvicides and, and spatial repellents. And we're working with um, the Institute of Medical Research there in, in PNG to build up their capacity and capability uh, for, for testing these tools. There are feedback loops into the work that we're doing in Africa as well. So looking at those uh, bite prevention tools um, in, in the GMS um, allows us to look at outdoor tools. Um, and this has allowed us to in, encourage and, and can, uh, facilitate um, links with uh, institutions such as, as I, IHI in Africa that are, are also looking at uh, outdoor tools and really helps to build up some of that um, canon of evidence on outdoor tools and, and standardizing the testing methods for evaluating those. Um, in terms of some of the products that we're looking at in, in PNG as well, um, if we are able to demonstrate efficacy and effectiveness uh, in the PNG setting, um, this can help us to um, expand slightly some of the markets um, for those for those novel tools globally. So we talked right at the beginning of, uh, of this presentation or you talked around keeping manufacturers engaged. If we're able to expand those those markets even very slightly, then it helps to um, it helps to make those markets more sustainable. And there could be payoff uh, as well in other other regions in terms of um, you know, sustaining affordable prices and so on. So that's how, uh, in theory, all of those um, uh, all of those kind of activities fit together. So the work started in in 2018. Um, the grant at the uh, at the moment runs until the middle of next year. So in, in PNG, um, the team there have built uh, a new laboratory and a new insectary, so really developing their their capacity there. Um, they were also building new semi field systems and experimental huts. Um, they've been able to recruit new entomology staff and train them. And uh, an IRS community trial started last year, a small scale community trial in a number of villages um, in, in Madang province on the north coast of, of PNG, which is going to run for, for 12 months. Um, <clears throat> in terms of what we're doing in, in Project Byte in the GMS, there are a number of semi field trials completed last year in uh, two sites in Thailand, a number of user acceptability studies completed. Uh, and at the end of last year, uh, the team completed a field entomology trial of bite prevention tools in, in Cambodia. Um, and those trials, the, the semi-field trials and the, and, and the field trials so far have showed really promising um, uh, performance of the tools that we were looking at. So just to give a bit more detail about those tools, um, we're looking at uh, insecticide-treated clothing, topical repellents and spatial repellents. 
delivered to at-risk target groups via a forest pack. So we know that forest packs are used by some of the ready uh, in those countries, and they have varying tools in them at the moment. Some have a topical, some have uh, clothing which is not treated, some have hammock nets. Um, we spent a long time actually at the beginning of the project trying to um, narrow down with our advisors and our and uh, our partners on what we thought would be an, an optimal um, configuration of, of products. And they're the three that we're working with at the moment. So um, that's our, our kind of achievements uh, to, to date um, on, on uh, IPI. Um, just to respond to your point around um, ADs, uh, evaluating tools against ADs, obviously ADs born disease is a, is a big um, challenge within Asia. In our current iteration of the grant, we don't have a huge focus on, on um, testing these tools against ADs. We did do some um, semi-field trials at those Thai sites under, under Project by uh, against Egypti. But because we we approached this grant in a kind of opportunistic way, um, encouraged by the funder to really move fast um, and try to apply quickly uh, what we know about uh, vector control innovation in Africa and, and what tools work there and, and try and understand what could be more impactful in Asia if uh, certain tools were introduced to markets or perhaps the tools are available already, but they just need to be scaled up for greater impact. We, we worked more on, on what we know uh, around malaria control um, and, and, and Anopheles and applied that. Um, as we go forward, uh, we'd like to work with our, our partners more to address uh, address the, the threats of, of aids borne diseases, because that's obviously a huge challenge in the area. So that's something that we're hopeful of doing into the future. But our main focus at the moment through these two projects are through are, are, are on um, uh, control of uh, Anopheles species. Um, so I'll stop there and um, yeah, happy to take any any questions or, or direction from you. No, I mean this is this is excellent. It's, it's it's a fantastic overview, and I think as you said earlier, it's nice also with the market expansion uh, process. We we have on the masterclass today uh, a number of colleagues from Southeast Asia or from the Indo-Pacific region. I, I noticed that uh, Jeffrey He is here, for example. Indra is here, so. I just want to pause a little bit and ask if any of them would like to make a quick comment about the differences uh, in malaria control or in vector control uh, between that region and, and, and Africa and what we need to look out for when it comes to, to vector control as, as is different between the, South, between the, the Indo-Pacific area uh, and Africa. So any Indra, um, uh, Derek Chalu does work there a little bit, he's on the call, uh, Jeffrey, could any one of you guys uh, make a quick comment on this? Sorry for, or Michael McDonald, if you're, you're able to speak. It's, 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 it's Michael here, sorry, I'm, I'm on the road on the Pennsylvania Turnpike right now. So I, I don't want to speak too much, but I, I do want to direct you to the IPCC website. Yes. And we have a technical landscape on uh, vectors in the Indo-Pacific. So I, let me ref not talk too much, but uh, refer you to that on the IVCC website. Uh, over. Excellent, excellent. No, thanks, thanks a lot. And um, yeah, so, so that so that Mike. Any other comments? All right. So we, we proceed. But in case we in case we have any comments from our colleagues from from the region that want to join in, uh, please feel free uh, to to do so. I think we we just uh, go, going to proceed here. Is a quick question for you, uh, Fred. About, about I mean you've mentioned uh, this a little bit, and could you just talk to us? I think Mike Matthias must have mentioned it earlier about the forest bugs. You know, like you have, how do you uh, some specific interventions that you are you are uh, developing for a mobile population, so for people working away from home for long long periods of time. Could you guys talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And I should have made that uh, clearer in in what I was saying around Project Byte. So Project Byte really focuses in on three main target groups. So those are forest dwellers, um, forest goers, so people that might live on the edge of the forest or in, in, in towns or villages in, in theory, but spend maybe two, three weeks at a time in the forest periodically working. 
Uh, and we're also looking at the forest ranger groups, uh, which are a small group in, and this, is, this focuses on in, in Cambodia um, uh, initially, but that, that's a smaller group of, of people who, who work in the forest uh, and are exposed to, um, exposed to malaria uh, on a regular basis occupationally. So um, yeah, this is, as I say, the forest, forest packs are um, deployed um, at a small scale. Uh, under certain programs already um, and um, it, it's about trying to maximize the, the the time in the day when when people are covered so um, if they're sleeping out in the day then that's when the um, the, the, the emphasis is on um, topical repellent uh, uh, compliance and we've also um, the, the team there did some very very interesting um, field uh, trials um, mocking up some kind of temporary um, shelters uh, just using tarpaulins which were a kind of typical of some of the, the temporary shelters that forest workers use when when they're out working um, and using the using those tools within those um, semi-outdoor structures and we found particularly the spatial repellent even in a very open-ended uh, semi-permanent structure perform very well. Um, so we, we, we're pretty encouraged by that. Um, it'd be interesting to see how it performs in, in, in different climactic conditions. But that's, yeah, that's the kind of the use case that we're looking at at the moment, you know, residual forest malaria and, mo and various mobile groups, be they rangers, workers, or people who live, live next to the forest. Um, and um, I'm, I'm sure Mike would, uh, you know, maybe could say something on this, but we, we're not looking at um, uh, kind of um, migrant groups as such at the moment, but we, we are aware that what we learn under this project could be translatable to humanitarian emergency situations as well. So that's something that we're keen to, to explore and, uh, and, and understand as well. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks a lot. And, and uh, 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 the document that Michael McDonald mentioned has already been posted by Matthias. Thank you so much. It's on the, it's on the, on the chat. Uh, we, we will proceed now. Um, we will not cover this. We had wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about the work you're doing on larvae siding, especially the work you're doing with the drones. Uh, we will cover this in a different masterclass. Uh, drawing towards the end, to, to, to the end now, we realize that innovation is very slow in this space. Uh, the involvement of IBCC and partners has kind of accelerated it, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, uh, Shella, did you have a question on this specifically? No, uh, so I'm just wondering if IBCC will ever work on gene drives. Any comments there, Matthias? So, no, we are not going to work on gene drive, not ourselves. We, we would be, we, have, we are. Um, we are collaborating with uh, with people who are working in GeneDrive because we are exchanging, you know, information related to, uh, to how best uh, to go to to establish, you know, uh, processes, um, uh, how to deal with uh, the regulatory pathway and so on and so forth. But it's not within our remit to engage in on on GeneDrive, and this just because, you know, the, in order to engage within those type of technology, you need to have a very specific level of expertise. And we do not have it, you know, either within IVCC or within our external scientific advisory committee. So we would like to engage. I mean, we would have to to significantly rebuild our structure, you know, to engage, to uh, include this type of uh, of specific expertise. Thank you, Matthias. Back to you, Fred. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot. And on that we just want to recognize very, very quickly the involvement of uh, the of IVCC, the way you're bringing in the industry partners on this zero by forty. And do you guys actually believe, maybe we bring in Christian a lot, a little bit here, we haven't heard from Christian for a while. Do you guys actually believe that there will be zero malaria by, 40, by 2040? I think, or is I think it just an aspiration? I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's a goal. Um, but, you know, I think there is always this poster that was on sort of my classroom walls growing up, um, you know, shoot shoot for the moon even if you fail you'll land among the stars or something like that so you know we uh you, you set the goal out there to reach and it, even if it might be aspirational we know that if we really try to go for it that um even if we miss it we'll we'll land somewhere near it um so i think i think that's that's the the beauty of of 
of, of setting a goal um, because you can work your efforts toward it. And even if you don't quite make it, you'll have made um, substantial, significant progress in getting there because of that focus. Thank you so, so much for that. And we, we are here. Hey, Matthias, you know? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with, uh, with Christian. What I want to, to say to everybody is that uh, it is possible, but it's only going to happen if we are actually able to, to do the necessary resource mobilization. And when I'm talking about resource mobilization, I'm talking about, you know, funding. Funding is going to be a, a critical element, but this is also, you know, people's mobilization, scientific mo mobilization to, to just make sure that, you know, all the different elements that are required in order to eradicate malaria are going to be lined up and are going to be done in the proper order with the proper yeah. in the appropriate level of coverage, uh, deployment and so on. And if we want, we can, but it, it really requires the input from everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so, so, so much. And we would like to also recognize the work that you do with partners, including we at Fakara Health Institute to build this network of good laboratory practices. We were looking for a map of countries where this uh, we now have proper GLP facilities to support the WHO PQ process. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find one, but we, we will include this in a future masterclass. We recognize the support that IBCC is providing to different labs. I'm um, speaking from experience from Ifakara Health Institute. It's been super uh, just to see how this has been built up to the level that we can, that data coming from the different sites is now clearly comparable, maybe it from Benin, from Tanzania, from different places. And I think that, has, that is uh, something that is also often ignored, uh, but a super contribution from, from IBCC and partners. Uh, this is a, a, a web page uh, a cache from um, uh, eye to eye, uh, Angus Spears, I believe you are on the, on the call. Thank you so much to you and your team as well, and it's great that you guys are putting it here. Uh, these are sites where you can now do very good laboratory at GLP accredited uh, 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 mosquito product testing, and I think this is this is a great effort. We just wanted to recognize that. We recognize broadly the, uh, the partnership, the, the efforts that the partnership um, is putting um, in, in, broadly speaking, in different interventions uh, for uh, improving the way we control malaria and other vector control. Uh, programs going forget forward. At the Fakara Health Institute, our uh, mission is to improve people's health and well-being. We believe that you, together with your partners, share in this mission. And we would like to, at this point, end by saying a big, 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 big thank you for spending three full hours and two minutes with us today on the 26th of May. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you all in the next masterclass. Uh, to our colleagues on the line, should you require these slides, please go to our YouTube channel or reach out to me by email and I will send you the, the, the chat messages. If you want to save the chat before you leave, please go ahead and save the chat before we close the class. For those who would like to share this message with uh, these links with other people, send me the names and we will include them in the invitation list or please just send it to them uh, to spread the message for those who want to join future masterclasses. I would like to end by asking our IVCC colleagues and partners for their last words, beginning with Kristen, Matthias, and then Andrew, and then uh, uh, Eric. Uh, we believe that you enjoyed the masterclass as much as we did. Uh, yeah. but, uh, please give us your, your final thoughts. Thanks, Thanks Fredros. Um, you know, I think we, we're sort of unsure coming into it exactly how, how it was going to run, but I think we all actually quite enjoyed it. It was it was actually a fun experience to be part of. So um, thank you for the organization and for the opportunity to come along uh, and present today. And uh, hopefully we provided um, some nice insight to folks about a little more about what we do. Um, so we're not so mysterious, um, as well as uh, you know explaining a little bit more maybe about the the the, the non um, scientific aspects of the work, more on the sort of the market shaping and the partnerships that maybe folks don't get to hear about uh, as often. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthias. Oh, thank you, thank you, Fred Ross, and thank you, Sheila, for, for the invitation. That was a, that was a very nice dialogue. I mean, I'm very conscious that uh, that we have just you know touch on 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 so many different topics. But one thing that I would like to to just uh, remember, remind everybody is that uh, nothing IVCC is doing we have, is done alone. We are only doing this in partnership with a really a uh, wide range of partners. There are quite a few that are today on the line, and I saw, you know, uh, people from West Ham who are developing the ATSB product. 
So just to say that, you know, they, they are the one really doing a huge amount of work. So thanks to all of those too. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Andrew. So I, again, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. And then just to end up to say that we do acknowledge that no one side fits it all. All partners are critical on this and we need to continue to engage all the industry players, country teams, the scientific community like Ifakara Institute and all the other local institutions in Sub-Saharan Africa that have contributed to where we are now. It's a great work, but more needs to be done. And then I think that we cannot look back, but to just look forward. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Eric. Great. Now, um, just to say thank you so much, Fredros, for having mm -hmm. us all on this call and, and for the masterclasses. They're really amazing. Uh, they're a really good opportunity to uh, get up to date with what's happening in, in, in this field. And so I'm, I'm just grateful to participate. Thanks. Thank you so much. We, we don't want to forget Fred Yeoman. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Fred Joss. Um, yeah, just thank you to uh, yourself and Sheila for inviting us today. Uh, I've watched many of the masterclasses as a member of the audience, so it was nice to contribute just in a very small way to, to this one. So uh, and thank you to everybody who's joined in on the chat and just to echo um, uh, Matthias's point as well. Uh, you know, we can't do any of this without our partners. So thank you to the partners for, for leading and um, uh, and all, all of their efforts in our programs as well. But um, yeah, thank you. Great, great session today. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much. And I send it back now to my colleague, my co-host, my super co-host, Shayla Goma, please. You take the last one. Thank you very much, uh, Fred. Uh, so thank, a big thank you, uh, Andrew, Fred, and Eric, of course, and, and Charles Wonji uh, for such a fantastic masterclass. Um, we now know what IVCC does. It's not just the scientific uh, side of things, but the access and the marketing side of things and ensuring that we actually have affordable vector control interventions in place and thinking about innovations around that. So thank you very much for sharing the knowledge. Um, and thank you so much for the participants for joining today. Uh, we had almost half I think about 100 people at the three mark hour and, and we thank you all for the participation and we look forward to another wonderful masterclass. Thank you, Fred. No, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks to Halfan Go and uh, Shell and uh, Sheha Salomo for helping in the background and to everybody, to all of you guys for participating. Uh, we see you next time. Do have a wonderful uh, 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 time. We will send an announcement for the 38th edition of the Masterclass, which will happen in June. Uh, and, and we hope that you can join with us and share the message. So have a wonderful day. Adios.